his presentation through so that we'll wait to points where he um, calls for our response rather than like last week when I requested people to jump in and out. Um, Nick right. has requested that that we let him basically run the show and he'll, right. he'll call us in. Right. OK, so um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, whatever it is, the 25th session of uh, the detailed discussion of the Tarot. Uh, tonight we're going to discuss the Minor Arcana, uh, which is uh, one of the four suits of the Minor Arcana, the Swords. And uh, my friend uh, Nick is going to uh, hold forth on the Swords. And so I'm going to turn you loose, Nick. And what I'm going to do uh, Gilda, while as Nick gets started here, is I'm going to go uh, pull the Crowley card and a couple of others that maybe I can show a, show us later after Nick's finished. Um, so hmm. anyway, Nick, it's your it's your evening. Go for it. All right, cool. So also just to just to clarify what Jordan was saying, I I hope that everybody will please you know any comment that you have, please if you would just square away a piece of paper and just make a note at whatever point that you, you have your comment. And whenever it's time for discussion, I'm happy to pull that card back up and we can have some, some discussion around the card. But I would just like to try to fire through what I've prepared so we don't get hung up in the, in the slide portion for too long. So let me get my screen share up here and I will commence. Okay. All right, so the suit of swords. First, a couple of words from one of my favorite swordsmen. If you have seen the Princess Bride, you get this. Um, anyways, all right. Okay, so what can we learn about the, sword, the suit of swords from examining the weapon and the symbol of the sword? The sword, as an instrument of cleavage, is a weapon that is used for separation. Separation is a process of making a distinction between two previously joined potentials. Kings, such as King Arthur, often knights, warriors, and men of the sword prior to stepping into the role of kingship, must take on a very keen and sharp ability to make decisions. Faced with many options for advancements of their kingdom, the ability to choose between one thing and deny another is one of the most necessary and prominent features of a king. Think of how much legislation and how many policies a modern president, a king by proxy, must sift through and make their decisions based upon. <clears throat> Just as the scales of justice are balanced, one can see that the balance comes from the keen capacity for discernment symbolized by the sword, and subsequently, the ability to then make a balanced decision which proportionally reflects justice for all. If we ask ourselves when considering the sword as a symbol, what is the sword in service to? Then we can see that the aim of the sword is to render by a separation, a state of balance, beauty, and justice, just as the scales of the justice card are balanced. The beautiful and divinely just woman of the justice card is the patron goddess presiding over the suit of the swords. So I thought this was really interesting and kind of fun to, to do some, uh, some, some thinking on. If you, if you ask yourself, you know, which of the cards of the major arcana kind of rule over the different suits? Um, I think that that's a fun little thinking experiment. Okay, so continuing. The sword is also a symbol of rationality, but in the true sense of the word and not the modern use as a pejorative descriptor of the overly materialistic mindset. The operative word, the operative root word of rationality is ratio. The etymology of rationality goes back to this word and it means reason and reckoning. When, when we say something like, oh, he is a reasonable person, what we mean is that the person in question is someone balanced and will have considered both sides rather than making a one-sided judgment. 
Doubtless, rationality can be, and often is, taken to an extreme, which gives a disproportionate credence to its purview. Not all things can be understood rationalistically, but nonetheless, both man and woman's capacity for reason and rationality is a divine capacity when kept in balance with other human capacities. Consider the scales of justice yet again. In one scale is the rational capacity for reason and logic. In the other scale is love, soul, and passion, which is most often accompanied by a loosening of the overly rationalistic tendencies. Either capacity unchecked by its opposite results in an imbalance. Elaborate, elaborating on the theme of ratio, the Greek word eugeia, or hygieia, comes to mind. The term is derived from the, from the name of the daughter of Asclepius, the god of healing and of the physicians, and she was the goddess of health. If health is considered psychically and not only physically, one can see that psychic hygiene or mental proportionality is a result of psychic balance and not only balance in outward health. Eugeia was given special significance among the Pythagoreans. Pythagoras, being the father of many forms of modern geometry, a math that aims at understanding an understanding of the platonic solids and translates as the measuring of the earth, based a form of math and metaphysics upon the idea of proportionality. Another way of expressing this insight, so central to the Greeks, is the inscription Medinagon, which the temple of Apollo bore, meaning nothing in excess. And this is actually a Pythagorean pentagram on the right here with the, the word Hygieia uh, around the outside. And as I stated previously, this is what they understood to be a symbol of, of psychic proportionality. Okay. With a consideration of the sword as a symbol and instrument of cleavage, discernment, separation, distinguishment, all in the service of ratio, proportionality, balance, and justice in the truest sense of the word, this gives new meaning to commonly quoted Bible passages and other perennial wisdom. Matthew 10, 34, think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. With the idea of cleanliness as expressed by the Greek eugeia, previously discussed as meaning balance, symmetry, and proportion, new meaning is given to the proverbial wisdom that cleanliness, eugeia, is next to godliness. Okay, so this one's dense. Uh, let me tear through this one quickly. <clears throat> Consider the birth and development of consciousness throughout one's life. We are born in a state of union with mother, environment, and world. As we begin to develop, we realize we do like mother's breast and we don't like the absence of the parent's shoulder. As we continue to develop, we learn we do like chicken nuggets and we don't like vegetables. Still growing, we learn that we do like English and art class and we don't like math class and science class. The development of consciousness, even at the earliest stages of one's life, is a process of separating into two opposing poles with consciousness oscillating between. Just like energy held between the two opposing poles of a battery, consciousness is born between two oppos opposing poles of comfort, discomfort, like, dislike, good, bad, and so on. However, this process of, so of separation never ends, but is scaled up to larger concerns. As we are older, the considerations become more sophisticated, such as deciding if we agree with Republican or Democratic policy. Do we believe in the religion of our parents, or do we have differing views that are better supported by other religious systems, and so on? Holding the tension of opposing views creates psychic energy, or libido, and the inability to consider opposing views characterized by the Synex figure, which just means old man, results in rigidity. Hence, the old king slain in so many alchemical engravings by the sword of a youth. So, consciousness, or more generally, thinking, is a constant process of separation, of weighing one against the other, determining value and quality, and then making informed choices. And what better symbol for this capacity than a sword? 
Just as water seeks its own level, so does the sword seek to balance and reunite that which it cuts from original unity, unity or the confused mast. Okay, so <clears throat> if anybody has any comments, please feel free to lodge them now. Okay, I have a comment. Um, great. It was beautiful that they did consider that consciousness is an act of separation. Consciousness separates, which is different than awareness. <coughs> so to consider that difference between awareness and consciousness is a very interesting thing. Maybe somehow you might resolve it here somewhere. Yeah, yeah, so further separation and distinction, yes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, what else was going to say? We, we found it interesting that justice was completely um, dressed in red. Yeah. <laughs> and it, she's active. Right, yeah. Yeah, I make a point to talk about that at least partially in uh, once I get to the cards, which just following this slide, I have a few uh, images that I hope kind of serve as a primer for the cards, but uh, it, this is pretty much the end of the extremely dense uh, text. Mm. Uh, anybody else? I have a, a comment. I, I when, when you went to the cleanliness is next to godliness, that really struck a chord for me with uh, the founder of Aikido, Morahei Ueshiba, who I believe said, the sacred sword, sharp and bright, allows no opening for evil to roost. Mm. And there's a cleanliness of, I think you were with a psychic proportionality you mentioned, and also a concept when learning the sword is work clean. Yeah. Meaning you literally, one of the disciplines is your house, your home, your rooms need to be clean and organized. Um, because when you're working with a sharp blade, any clutter internally provides distraction Whereas with a sharp katana, you literally can cut off your own calf, your own foot if you miss. Um, so I thought that was, I like that cleanliness is next to, next to godliness because there's, there's so much in that message that can be unpacked. So thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. yeah can I share uh, backing, piggybacking on that one is that Jung said that um, the surgeon had to have clean hands in order to okay. do any surgery meaning that anyone who we're talking about interpretation of dreams and such, that you have to have clean hands before addressing another. And who has perfectly clean hands? Stand right. up, please. Stand up, please. But that is the objective. Yeah, that's, that's a wonderful, uh, wonderful analogy. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, if nobody has anything else, I will uh, sally forth. So like I said, you know, I, I have a series of images to show before we get into the cards. And I really hope for both the panelists and the viewers that as we go through this, I want to engage everyone's intellect as much as I can, but I also really hope to engage everyone's imagination. So with that in mind, and also in this previous slide, I wanna just make this point one more time. At the bottom here, I say, hence the old king slain in so many alchemical engravings by the sword of a youth. So going forward, here are just a couple of images. On the left is Paracelsus, which is a uh, famous physician and all around personality. Um, and he apparently, this was a real sword that he carried for a long time and he was a, a pretty small man and the sword was fairly tall. So he would often be in the town pub with this massive sword, just sitting at the bar, having drinks and, and carrying on and just have this, uh, this ridiculous sword to suit his bombastic personality. And also if you look on the hilt of the sword, it says Azov, which is a, um, pretty much the, the helping friendly spirit in alchemy. On the right, I, I made this point in some of the text where I said that consciousness is a process of, of separation, of separating out things from the confused mass. Another way of thinking about that is that 
the world is born in this this orphic egg and it's it's our job to to cut out pieces of it to to re to remove the world from this state of original unity and constantly separate it in a variety of ways and integrate as much as we possibly can into ourselves rather than identifying with it. Okay, so the, um, the old king slain by the, uh, the sword of the youth on the left here, obviously we have this old king being uh, stabbed by this, this younger, younger man here. And if you look just below his waistline, he's got AZ. So again, there's this, this Azoth uh, of the alchemist here. And really, if you think about an old king and what an old king represents, um, to me, it would represent a rigidity in your views. You know, when you reach that point in your life, <clears throat> I imagine that, you know, any person would want to feel like they have figured some stuff out. They know some stuff. They know where they stand on a lot of issues. And while that is good, I think the flip side of it is that, you know, you take on a certain rigidity um, and depending on your, your worldview, that, that can present a real problem that needs to kind of be um, dissolved. And uh, on the right here, we have uh, King Arthur um, calling his sword up from the water. <clears throat> uh, two more alchemical engravings and drawings. The one on the left here, we have the queen and the king and uh, Mercury or Mercurius in the center here. And as you can see with all the talk of separation, there's also the word separatio. On the right, still another king and queen, but they are joined um, and it, there's also a striking similarity between the sword that the, that the king is holding, the king's side of this figure is holding, and the ace of swords, which I thought was really interesting. These are from earlier versions of the Splendor Solace deck, uh, which we've gone over on his channel, but these are, um, I, I don't know how much earlier, but they are a bit earlier, um, obviously not as artistically rendered. Uh, okay, going forward, two more. I included this one on the left because I thought it was really interesting that just like the justice card, this lady holds scales and a sword. And uh, on the right, we've got a king with his sword. And uh, at the bottom, it says corpus sal, the body of salt. Um, okay. So now into the cards. <clears throat> All right, so this is, this is the whole suit, the ace through the 10. Um, and now I'll move into the individual cards. Okay, the ace of swords represents the sword of great power, the sword of kingship, the keen capacity for discernment and being highly perceptive the ability to be shrewd and penetrate into the heart of the matter. Okay, the justice card's sister, this is the card of blind justice as opposed to the justice of solar clarity in her sister's card. She is unaware of the external world and her reasons are rooted in total subjectivity, making her rationale and her reasons unknowable, at times unknown even to herself a card of imbalance, the ever-changing tides of subjectivity and of the phasic nature of the moon. The suit of swords. Since the suit of swords deals with thinking and thought with no difficulty at all, one can see that thinking is usually the opposite pole of love, passion, and desire. We don't intellectualize love or seek out a partner with a list of requirements. Cupid's arrows just stick us. In the case of this card, it symbolizes the over-intellectualization that limits love and passion and causes desire to wither on the vine. Love is characterized by a loosening of the rational capacity, and the rational capacity is often characterized as a limitation of this loosening, resulting in head-over-heart scenario. 
the scales of justice are tipped in favor of thinking over filling. The four, this card symbolizes a brief repose between the turbulent winds of war. The mind may be constantly blown about like a ship on the sea, but here the winds die down and allow for a period of rest. A temporary balance in homeostasis is achieved. Even great warriors need a day of rest. Okay, so we've gotten through the first couple of cards. Does anybody have anything they want to say? Yeah, here we go. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, um, we'll begin with the Two of Swords, okay. where um, it, uh, it mentions that she's blind because she has all this subjectivity. Mm -hmm. we, we had this revelation the other day, whether it's true or not, it's hard to say, that um, up to like 25 years of age or 28, the cycle, all the cells are always in constant growth. Mm -hmm. So they don't, you, you don't see, you're active, you're just growing, growing, being, being, be doing, doing, doing. And then comes the second, next 28, and, and women, women have 28 cycles, 28 mm. day cycles. Right. This 28 is Saturn. Saturn is the karmic planet and it has cycles of 28 uh, mm. years. And I believe that's part of, so the next 28 years, then you're kind of like, oh, okay, I've already done that. Now there's something else going on. So the subject, you're not blind because you've already went through a whole cycle. Yeah. So this time around in the next cycle, oh, but the, this cycle, since it's number two, is when you're just starting to grow. That all you've got is what you came with, and then you're learning your way about. So yeah, and, I think that the, the cycle of growth definitely takes on a wholly different character in the second act of life. Exactly, well, absolutely. I, both, I, I think that's the case for both, both sexes. Yeah, and the, yeah, both sex, um, but but the female exhibits the twenty-eight right. day cycle in a physical way. That's that's why I mentioned it. And right. the in the fourth month, when you said that uh, the warrior needed rest, card number four, swords, mm -hmm. it's really quite obvious that the rest is when you're dreaming, when you're down. That everyone needs to go into that dream space in order to uh re again um reach that homeostasis to get up next day so mm -hmm. since it's lying down it's definitely that is required to the dream state is a requirement of advancement you cannot do without it mm -hmm. so that's something else about that yeah I, I mean on one hand i do agree that it's seems obvious that it's a period of repose which i mean has for its meaning some kind of rest it could be sleep but i think there's a distinction between this card where he's just just lying there and then also the eight of swords where someone is so clearly in a bed and waking from from sleep mm, okay well this is the beginning the beginning you're just asleep and you're not very aware are you you're just starting out to find out, but lucid dreaming, maybe the eights, I don't know, I'll have to look at it when you get there. But uh, it, to me, this card tells me that you need to go inside in order to recharge. Oh, yeah. yeah, the, the inner sanctuary, most certainly. Yeah, and dreams, is, that's exactly what dreams do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the dream state, yeah. wherever you happen to be in the four, four sections of, of sleep, even as dreams, dreamless sleep, which is where you get all the, whichever section it is, it is a requirement to revive. Right. Okay. Uh, Nick, I'll dovetail right on that. I yeah, appreciate the, this card about inner communication. And I really appreciated your um, King Arthur and Lady of the Lake when hip, and you saying he called out his sword, you know, Excalibur. Um, do you see then the Lady of the Lake as, that's him engaging his unconscious? Well, that definitely could be an interpretation. Um, I, I hadn't given it any thought, but um, I don't find that to be disagreeable at all. I think it's also interesting that it comes 
at least in this presentation, after the cups. So it would be that, you know, he's separating this capacity out from the water that fills the cups. Whether that be the unconscious or the emotional sphere, I, I don't know. But I, either way, I think it's, it's pretty rich. Yeah, both and. I, yeah, I like that. Mm -hmm. it's, I just, it, it's this sword underneath him, uh, mm -hmm. in a sense, he is his own sarcophagus, that kind of life and death of uh, the lucid dreaming and or um, the conscious swords above. There were pain before, but now they're simply a painting. They're hanging as experience in a way. And his no. inner communication has come, come to the fore. Exactly in the window, the window has a whole scene going on. Mm -hmm. That means that in his sleep, there's there there's all this aliveness going on. I did not notice that. But the window, why why should the window right. be full of life when his eyes are closed? So that well, means that he has an inner life that comes alive when he lies down. Right, and in in cathedrals, architecturally, uh, from a symbolic perspective, every piece of stained glass is intended to be the voice of God and light. So that dream state would be his inner, di inner divinity speaking, uh -huh. telling that story. Right there, yeah. I think it's also no noteworthy to point out the three vertical swords and then one heart. Oh, oh, I, know, uh, I know that um, at least in terms of what lines are used for and logos and, and, and artwork and stuff like that, not logos of the philosophical variety, but literally logos, um, that you know vertical lines represent strength and often often agency uh, government and stuff like that and then horizontal lines have to do with uh, um, passivity peace moments of uh, moments of repose so then if you that's a good point with the verticality and logos like banners advertising <laughs> logos that's a great pun and, and also applicable if you notice too the swords the one on the right is pointing to his third eye. The one on the middle is pointing down to that right below the thir throat chakra. And then the next one is pointing to the solar plexus. And then underneath him, the down going, going back to the unconscious left. So it's, it's in this card. All of these cards are so rich. I'll, I'll pause right there. But it, um, I like the way you're running um, your concepts. Looks like Skip heard logos. That was great <laughs> that the bottom one is pointing to the sacrum. So yeah. when you're asleep, the unconscious, which is rooted below, not up here, right. is the one that comes alive. <laughs> can, I, can I comment? Hi, everybody. Hi. First, yeah. I arrived late, so I, I was trying to participate for a while, but no, <laughs> I wasn't updated to panelists until like a, a minute ago. But I, I have been listening, so I'll just jump in if I may. Uh, sorry, Samantha. The reason was that I was... Uh, you had to step getting, away? I had to work on some cards, but um, no problem. anyway, I'm glad you're here now. And yeah. there are a couple of others I just admitted as well. And I, I'm sorry, Patricia, and others that I didn't have you. In that's, all, yet. that's all right. Just in case on, on YouTube actually let me know what was going on. Because I was like, is this... Personal? What? What is that? What is funny? But it it's wasn't all, personal. <laughs> okay, good. Well, I love what I'm I'm seeing. Um, and Nick, yeah, it looks great. So I might have to catch up a little bit because there's some concepts earlier that I was just like multitasking while you were talking about it. But mm -hmm. uh, I do have something to say about this card, um, okay. which is that I do agree that it is about uh, repose. Um, and, you know, I kind of have a, a numerology base in, you know, in terms of how I taught myself about this card. So I want to say a few things about that, if I may. Sure. So the, the four, uh, there are four swords, which I was mentioning last week, how I read that is it, there's a light and a dark to four because four can be a foundation or four can be a cage, you know, um, or, you know, a box, the proverbial box that you put your mind in, you imprison your mind in. So I was relieved when I've used this for divination for myself to see uh, that it's more for me, that it's thinking of it that way helps me to see that this is more about, um, about that duality, right? Mm -hmm. About how, I, I think it's about anxiety. <laughs> That's what I see, like for, you know, feeling, feeling um, caged in, but 
uh, the stained glass window, according to one book I read, is is uh, highlighted in terms of in the stained glass window. They were saying this is a, a story of Jesus healing uh, someone asking for healing. Mm -hmm. So there is hope. So the way I look at this card also is that I don't identify with the statue that that figure, which some people say is a person, but I read it as like that's a, an image on a sarcophagus. Yeah. I. And uh, to me, the sarcophagus looks, or, or coffin, looks open a bit. So I think it has to do with um, potential for resurrection. And then also when you're alone and the, the coffin has one sword. Wait, I should be clear. I'm not talking about resurrection yet. There's one sword on the coffin and three on the wall. And one can mean um, aloneness. So if you're unto yourself, if you're thinking in a, only in a vacuum, right? I know I've done that, like perseverating, maybe a lot of people relate to this. It causes anxiety or it can make you feel like you said, there's no eros in it, right? So if you're too, so to me, that's what the one sword on the coffin means. And then the three has to do with community, right? Um, for self-supporting structure and, you know, the first, the first unit of a community, um, technically, if you, you know, following me. I don't want to go off on a tangent, but you're kind of following me. So the three swords are on the wall, which are also closer to the stained glass. So I think it's about um, an option there. And, and also if there is death, I think the death is more metaphor, metaphorical. Yeah. Um, Cause you have a choice to get out of it. Yeah. I would completely agree with that. Right. It's also so uh, Samantha, one of the things that uh, Nick asked for, was that we let him go through his uh, discussion completely and then we take notes and come back to the points we want to make. So I would appreciate it if we would honor that until Nick is done. So if you would keep notes on the things that you want to talk about, then we can come back to you. So. Yeah, I only requested that people just, you know, when you see a card and something comes up, just make a star put down a keyword or something of the sort. I'm not going to go through everything and, and just do it in one blast, but I would like to kind of go through big chunks and then talk about some stuff, keep going. And we can also double back uh, when you want to, you know, make your comment or wh what have you. Okay. So moving forward here, I, uh, that is unless Raquel or anybody else has anything that they would like to say. I'm waiting until until you're you're done. Actually, <laughs> I'll make yeah. comments afterwards. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. So moving forward. All right. To the five of swords. This court. This card shows an undignified and menacing victory, leaving the men in the background indignant and seeking vengeance and swift retribution. Justice is a dish best served cold a victory lacking in valiance and nobility, unearned victory. Okay, on to the six here. Parting ways, separation, putting distance between. A woman takes her small child to a distant shore, seeking new life and a departure from that which no longer serves her. Movement, journey, and maybe even divorce from a partner following a period of renewal. Okay, to the seven. Stealing away like a thief in the night, the man makes off with the swords of the men in the tent, elevating his desires for the shiny swords over his logic. Logic begs the question, how will we carry these, I, I put we, rather I should have put I, how will I carry these swords away? Surely he won't, get, he won't avoid detection for long and will likely be caught by the legions of angry men in the tents, now without swords. As Jung said, Beware of unearned wisdom. Okay. So, uh, you know, just as a um, uh, disclaimer, this is not to be interpreted in, in terms of biology or gender, but just more from a symbolic perspective. So the, uh, the damsel in distress, which needs the young knight to save her. 
a common mythological and fairy tale motif, this is a situation of rescuing the soul, which has fallen into peril from overemphasizing rationality. Statements such as me, I don't have a soul, that's nonsense, belong to this card. We place our soul in immediate danger when we neglect the praetor rational. After all, not all of life is rational. Okay, this is the Nine of Swords. The soul appears to us in dream to warn us of the imminent danger of losing her and of rationalizing the soul away. This is the soul's last attempt, the black horse and the nightmare alerting us to our smallness, lest we heed the clarion call to live life soulfully. All right, the Ten of Swords. The warning of the previous card goes unanswered and we face our fate in the form of imminent doom. Denial of the call surely spells ruin for the refuser. As stated previously, rationality can be a gift given by God, but it can just as quickly be that which ruins us. If rationality is considered in terms of ratio, then one can see here that the ratio, the scales of justice, tip too far in the direction of rationalism and allow the soul to languish. Okay, so uh, we can uh, have some more discussion here if you guys would all like. I only have the court cards left. Um, so if anybody has anything to say, please uh, go ahead. I'd like to say something. Go ahead. Uh, would, would you mind going back through the cards just real quick and then but you're going, but stop on six? Yeah. I just want to prove a point, so I kind of wanted to see. Yeah. Perfect. Um, and then, actually, sorry, can, can you go back to five for a sec? Okay, and then six and, and, and stop. <laughs> sorry, I got messed up. Okay, great, thank you. So I wanted to, I, I really like um, the progression. Um, like I hadn't considered the card, this card from this point of view, but I think that's, that's a nice uh, like psychological case study, like like flag that I hadn't considered about the woman as a char main character and is she gonna get divorced from this guy? Like in my head, I went on that story. But I also think um, I wanna offer the point of view that this can also be a contrast to uh, the, the previous card where they're using their it could be, you know, swords representing mind, the guys that, uh, it could be using your mind to hurt people, to cut people down, you know? Um, I would assume that as they were, you know, messing with their swords, it's supposed to be like a wand fight. Like they're supposed to be uh, practicing their skill. They're all on the same team. And then he looks like he's gloating. Whereas in this, this individual who's on the, who's steering the boat, I looked at them Maybe I identified more with them just psychologically, but I thought they were kind of the main character um, in that they're using their mind for good. They're using it to help someone else. And then we also see the wand appear. So it could be they're taking action to, to help someone and follow through on what they think is the right thing to do. Just wanted to offer that. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's, that's uh, an interesting perspective. Certainly, I am. Uh, I do, it, you know, I didn't incorporate this into my thinking about the card nor into what I've written about the card, but I think it's also, when just looking at the details, I think it's worthy of, of noticing that the choppy water on the right seems to be what they're heading away from. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, I uh, in the previous card, I kind of, rather than just regurgitating information that I've read about these cards or anything like that, I tried to really just imagine the situation as it, as it may be unfolding. Mm -hmm. And I definitely imagine in this previous card that, you know, this is probably meant to be a battle of, of might, but rather it turned into a battle of wits and like he ah, probably outsmarted these guys, but you know, maybe they're just like, we're going to get you for this. Certainly just wait till you go to sleep or something. Um, but I think that fits with what you're saying. Um, well, if you could click to the six right there too, the choppy water on the right, 
would be un, would be the conscious waters, so to speak. And then the calm waters on the left and the white trees in the background are very dreamlike, very imaginal, um, like the unconscious in a way. And I really appreciate your concept of the, it's a great concept of the swords of psychic proportionality. You had a circular diagram with the Da Vinci Man and five astrological symbols earlier. Could, could you speak to that psychic proportionality a little or psycho, psychological proportionality a little yeah, more? Yeah, definitely. Um, the idea for me has to do with, um, I'll make it in terms of my own typology. Um, you know, I know Skip and a few of you are familiar with MBTI and maybe some of you are not, but nonetheless, I think you'll be able to understand what I'm saying. Um, so I'm an, I'm an INTJ, which means my dominant function is introverted intuition and my uh, auxiliary function is extroverted thinking. Beyond that, I've got introverted filling in the tertiary position. And then as my, um, my inferior function, the function closest to the unconscious is um, extroverted sensation. So in terms of proportionality, I think that, you know, because I have introverted intuition, I tend to lean too, uh, too heavily on my introverted intuition a lot of the times, you know. I can definitely get lost in the world of intuiting things and trying to think about the big picture. And, you know, that's, that's all good and well. I think that, you know, it's, it's a blessing and a curse. But if I don't do my best to check that intuition with my thinking function, then I can really get bent out of sorts. And more so if I rely too heavily on my extroverted thinking and I don't pay attention to my, my introverted feeling, which since it's introverted and since it's further down in the stack takes much more psychic energy for me to go into, you know, since I'm aware that it's there, I'm able to kind of orient to my feeling function and, and um, take in information that way, make judgments that way. But it's not as easy. It doesn't come as naturally to me. So I have to be very conscious not to over intellectualize situations and approach situations with feeling. You know, I, I personally can be crass and, and be um, too straightforward sometimes. And that's a struggle for me. So psychic proportionality for myself would be expressed in the ways that I just said by, you know, rather than constantly thinking in terms of my extroverted thinking and leaning on my introverted intuition uh, by checking those with the extroverted sensation world, looking and thinking like, well, I'm thinking all this crazy stuff and I see the way all of these 10 different systems link up, but is it obvious to anybody else? Can I actually express that in the world? Or, you know, the way that I think about things can be um, kind of rigid and kind of lack um, a dimension of filling sometimes. So I think psychic proportionality, it's constantly checking those things, which I'm most often relying on with the other things that are, um, don't come as naturally to me. That's a, thank you for going at length there. In fact, that even goes with the card where six of swords here, where we don't see any faces, but now we have the four quaternity that we had in the four of swords. And then the two, the twin that are sitting down, the mother and the child, and then the masculine and standing. So you, you get the as above, so below, then both crossing over the child. And even in his stance, two feet in the pole, you know, mm -hmm. it's a it's not a paddle, it's a, the pole to push the boat along that he's standing in a tripod. Um, and, and, you know, his his ground is a trinity to mm -hmm. protect then their, their, their communications, basically, as they look through that middle way of the swords mm -hmm. does that make sense to everybody what i've said is that is there anything i need to, to clarify or is that, is that, that a, okay yeah great. thank you i like the psychic proportionality it's a great swords concept and i appreciate you going it, it further linked into it okay I, I do have one more comment that i think will be useful before we go to court cards i'm assuming you're cool you're ready to go I mean, um, we can really stretch out at this point i only have four cards left so anything anybody prepared for the minor arcana let's go ahead and let's go ahead and get into it okay well there's two points 
The first is, uh, well, I'd like to ask, and then I, I had a question pop up in my mind and then I think I already answered it, but I'd like to share the question in case it, um, there's something new that pops up for you, sure. which is, I was gonna say, I was following what you said about the personality type that you identify with. And, um, and I was like, I, I was thinking, well, how is tarot helping you personally? You know, I'm, I'm curious about that. Um, okay, so, but I'd like to hold that <laughs> to make my other point first, if I may. The other point I wanted to make is um, uh, to, to address gender for a second. I understand that it's a metaphor. I hear you saying that, Nick, but we are also making assumptions because um, the, the and, I, and I didn't realize that until someone mentioned the, the woman, right? Um, that I assume she was a woman, but I think it can also be a symbol of just seeking shelter. You know, someone could be under a blanket because they're cold type of thing. That's, that's definitely what I got from it, as well as the person with the, their face not facing us. Um, you know, Pixie the, tended to be, um, tended to be uh, she would represent androgynous characters. And it's also like said that she, she may have been, she was known to be possibly a lesbian. So I think she's sort of just representing more of an androgyny there. Um, and I wanted to say that. That aside, um, I think masculinity and, femininity and femininity can still apply. I think it makes sense to look at that person with the pole as a man and the other person as a woman and a child. But I thought that would be a good counterpoint. Now, as for the suit itself, because uh, you guys mentioned the unconscious, no, the conscious is the rippling water, troubled waters, and then the unconscious is on the, the left. And I thought about this as being an answer in my own head to the question I was gonna ask you. So I'm curious as if it's, if it's gonna line up, but something to do with, uh, for me, I find if I'm a relay thinking, I haven't done my MBT, but thinking is what I go to as well. And I like the, to, to be rigorously intellectual and I'm attracted to, to reading and groups like this and all that. But I too feel like um, I can, I can um, lend too much, go too much to that side. And so specifically, not just for, there's sirens in the background, not just for communicating with people, but to launch, to, to put the thinking into action right mm -hmm. so i can rationalize my way out of something i thought my way into that was a good idea but with the same tool so i think thinking of that pole as a wand as action um in order to because it's only one body of water i don't know if i'm being clear here but the unconscious can sometimes be ripply and louder and more chaotic so it feels difficult to get or excuse me the conscious mind that is chaotic can seem like a barrier to get to the deeper depths. But when you align your unconscious with your conscious mind, like for instance, if you have, if you consciously want something, let's say you consciously want your degree or a certain career or your own business, whatever, but your unconscious mind has these unprocessed traumas um, or, or is unprocessed, uh, uh, if there's self-sabotage in there, then you can't really do it. You'll always find a way to to fail because you unconsciously want to sabotage yourself. So mm -hmm. I think that the sword, I, I think that there's a message in the, the pull, taking action on what those thoughts are, um, has something, to, the ability to do that has to do with moving toward the unconscious. Yeah. So that the waters can be all one. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that, you know, there's a wonderful, wonderful quote from Jung and I, I'll just be paraphrasing this. I can't recall it exactly, but it's something along the lines of um, that and the unconscious, which you don't make conscious will continue to rule your life and you'll call it fate. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's, that's a, a, a wonderful insight because uh, you know, I think it's also a key feature of a lot of, Jungian people, more generally kind of dream oriented people that they say, I ask my dreams about this, you know, I really paid yeah. attention to what's stirring in me uh, before embarking on some endeavor or journey or something like that. And, yeah. you know, I think that that's, that's really valuable because I think a lot of people, uh, 
I think that the ego's agenda oftentimes is um, not in harmony with whatever is going on in the unconscious. And, you know, we can set that clock for eight o'clock every morning to get up at work, but tons of people sleep through it because something in them is just like, screw this. I don't want to go to work, whatever. But, you know, obviously consciously, everybody's like, yeah, I'm going to be a good worker and get up and go to work and I'll be there on time. But it's, it's more complicated than that. And that's a very simple example, but you know, it, it is, I think it is an idea of harmony between the two levels. Uh, yeah. Raquel? Yeah, I just, uh, I wanted to bring some examples of the mythical tarot, if I might. Please, yeah. Um, I thought it was great that you made the analogy with the justice card right at the beginning, because the first, the ace of, of swords in the mythical tarot is actually Athena, the goddess of war. Beautiful. And she is in the position, and it, the goddess of justice, she is in right. the justice card, actually. This is the justice card. Yeah. But here she is in a passive mode, and here is she's in battle mode, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. So she, um, so she kind of gives like the tone of the, the sword suit in this, in this deck. And it's a very difficult de uh, deck to work with in the sword suit mm -hmm. because it's actually a tale of how a man is like confronted with um, social responsibilities of his environment that he doesn't want to really know about so in the two of swords uh nick you mentioned it in, right at the beginning of your presentation that the swords uh suit could be like the the differentiation you know of the separation of two opposites and uh -huh. here is the main character of the the history orestes uh -huh. and he, these are his parents so he's really uh -huh. differentiating himself from his parents yeah you know? And, and his parents are the, um, the destiny that he doesn't want to confront. So in the Three of Swords, uh, the destiny uh, begins to unravel for him because this right. is his mother killing his father. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and this is the big betrayal because mm -hmm. then uh, in the Four uh, uh, of Swords, he's just like in this, in the passive mode, meditating mm -hmm. and contemplating his reality. But in the Five of Swords, he gets confronted with his destiny by the god Apollo, mm -hmm. which you also mentioned in, in, the, in the beginning of your presentation. Yeah. Um, and the, 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 the good thing about uh, this particular deck is that um, Orestes is a man and he's like, this poet and kind man and he doesn't really want to uh, portray the more masculine active side of manhood so mm -hmm. apollo is here actually uh, demanding him to be more active in this uh, man role that he never wanted to play mm -hmm. and in the six of swords that you guys were saying like the the water here is more emphasize because he's running away to somewhere to somewhere more peaceful you know because here in the skies there's the storm and he's running away also from um turbulent waters so mm -hmm. he's going to another place where everything is calmer so it's not just it's a movement but it's a movement toward peace you know he's running away from the situation altogether mm -hmm. Uh, and the Seven of Swords, he, he's alone in the middle of the night trying to uh, face his destiny. Mm -hmm. And by the end of the cards, it's just him being like better <laughs> by several different entities of what he didn't do or what, what he made wrong through his... Um, through his journey and at the very end of his journey athena comes back again mm -hmm. and she is the one to make his agony 
go away. So um, I think that. All right, can we can we put Raquel on the full screen because I couldn't yeah. see the images. Oh my god. Yeah. I like, I'm hearing it. I'm following it with my ear, but not my eyes. Let me see here. In order to do that, I will stop. Yeah. Can you make her? A, do we need to make her a co-host or? That's the tarot deck I use, by the way. Which deck is that? The, the mythic, mythic tarot. Yeah, the mythic tarot. I've used it for Thank 20, you. Oh, for. Boop. It's my and favorite. Really quickly, while you guys do this, I'm going to go take a bio break really quick. Yeah, Samantha, what you need to do is set your view on full screen view or speaker view oh. if you want to see her yeah. on the whole screen. And then, oh. of course, we had to have uh, mm -hmm. we had to have Nick uh, okay. relinquish the screen to us again. We like the colors in that deck. Well, Raquel, I appreciate you brought up that justice theme because when Nick brought up that original alchemical picture, if you, you if you remember, he can put it up maybe again later. But you have the scales, but the scales are tipped because. The heavy yeah. is on the right, and the one on the left is the lighter cup that has the scale has risen. So then you have the sword coming out the other side, and that's the active motion of justice. I'm just going um, to put this this cards right here. I mean, the good thing about the <laughs> archetype is that uh, when she is passive in this in this card, in justice card, um, it's not an actual like. Uh, she's the 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 greatest um, warrior god. I mean, she's the one that you go to when you want want to win a war. So right. when she's in the passive mode, she's actually doing a kindness to you. You know what's mm -hmm. on her shoulder? The owl. It's an uh -huh. owl. It's wisdom. Wisdom. Yeah, wisdom. Mm -hmm. owl yeah is wisdom. And, and Pallas, who's also Athena and Minerva, is she makes her strategic acumen makes mm -hmm. Mars look like he's playing checkers to yes. her chess. Yes, absolutely. But in this card, she's like, oh, ready to go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, oops. Here, and that's that's the image. No more Nick strategies. Had. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Time I, time I, for responsibility. <laughs> No, I think that, that card, Raquel, the, the first one that I saw you show, I think that that's a good point that you're making because justice isn't always cutting someone down with the sword. Sometimes justice is, I have the ability to, but I yeah. choose not to. Even in criminal justice, it's like how um, a criminal justice lawyer came to my high school and was talking, uh, you know, we're for a career day. We had different people in the classrooms and uh, someone asked them, well, how can you represent someone who like murdered someone or did something that you thought was awful? And the lady's response was that it was, she liked her job because she felt everyone deserved a, a fair trial. And I had never thought of it that way, that it's that perhaps it's about getting the, the punishment, the, the punishment if a crime is performed to the punishment should should equal the crime, but it shouldn't be cruel. It shouldn't it shouldn't be cruel and unusual. Well, so I, I, want, I want to address that too, because in criminal defense, you're also def defending all of us. Yes. Uh -huh. Against against uh, society gone mad. Right. Okay. And yes. and so. Um, you know, O.J. Simpson got off not because he didn't do it, but because if the police run amok on on uh, criminals, that you know, then uh, we're all going to be in trouble. You know, a la George Floyd, and so we want right. we want society. So the defense attorney is also def def defending us against the government run amok and from vigilantism and yeah, from vigilantism right I, I have to step away actually um uh, for a minute but i just wanted to respond that i think that there's also um because because it is debatable whether george floyd actually committed a crime at all 
And so, oh, that is, so that's, that's right. And, right. So, and, so I just, I just wanted to speak to that because I think he, after that event, a lot of people were criminalizing him and bringing up other things about his past. And, right. and, and that's he, why he would have deserved an attorney to defend right. him. And that was for what? The Skip's <laughs> point. That was Skip's point to yeah, defend yeah, him against the vigilante police officers. Yeah, okay. exactly. So, to convict so, them. Okay, cool. So, um, I, but I also wanted to say also with OJ Simpson that he also had the, the money to pay for this like rock star lawyer, you know, so, so some people interpret that as uh, it's really that his money that protected him and, and his fame, you know, um, even though. Well, you know, but, but what I would say to that is that the people who defended OJ Simpson defended all of us because it I made that. police. It made police work all over the country be more careful. And mm -hmm. they did doctor evidence that was actually unnecessary to do if they had performed right. a proper and, investigation. And so, and so, so yes, he got away with it, uh, and he was later found liable in a civil court. Right, so he did it. <laughs> no, the, the civil court said he did it, but from a criminal perspective what those defense attorneys did was defend us all against sloppy police work. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's Thank you. get back on topic here. Yeah. Uh, okay. Go ahead, Nick. So actually, uh, Nick, could you go back to that picture you had of Can the, we go to not seven? the card? Actually, not there. Can we go to the picture of justice that you had before in the beginning of the presentation? Sure. That's not the tarot card where the cup is up on the right or on the left. And then it's going down, but then the sword emerges on the other side, which is the justice, justice in action. Yes. One. Which is that point Raquel was beautifully making there with the mythic tarot. Of look yeah, at justice Raquel, here. What, what you, had, you had wanted to? No, the little further back, not the card. It was one of your alchemical images, oh. black and white, with a circle of justice, I believe. There it is, right there. Yeah. And you see that the, the scale is light on the left and pointing down heavy on the right. So we don't see the other cup. We see the mm -hmm. justice in action emerging as the other cup of the scale on the right side. Yeah. Which I mean, that's I, parallel to Raquel's story with the mythic tarot. Yeah. I, I think it's, it's worth pointing out. I'm not completely sure of all these words, but I think it represents the... Um, the four seasons and less of a um a justice in the sense of of um of of court and matters to do with the law and legal affairs but i, I think it has to do with the idea that there's this kind of cosmic scheme of justice going on within the cycles of nature to where every season is balanced by the one opposite to it and uh and that reflects this kind of, more, as I said, more cosmic justice rather than thinking about it in terms of day-to-day uh, -day life. Well, right, and you're right on the seasonal, the autumnus, hinds, ver, and asfar. I mean, you get the autumn, winter, spring, ver, like vert or verde, green, and then asfar, I think is summer. And what so is you, the one on top, the seal top? I'm talking about the words, the Himes, H H I. Um, they have autumnus and then Himes. I'm not sure what the S C H A and O, but it is spelled chaos. Now that I see that, um, mm. <laughs> that I think Lisa Lisa just mentioned that. Now I get what she was saying. Yeah, it is um, the ring of it is the ring of chaos, and within it, the the, the cosmic order, which I know we said right. several times, both with reference to the justice card, but you know. The Egyptian goddess Maat, this is what she symbolized that, you know, within chaos, there is this order, this cyclic nature and all of these principles inherent in nature that really reflect this, a cosmos rather than chaos. Um, right. And the like goddess Maat uh, is the keeper of the door to the underworld or to the afterlife. Um, so you're, she's the one who weighs your heart against a feather. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay, um, so if nobody has anything yeah, else. Number seven, can we look okay. at number yeah, seven? Great. Um, 
after uh, the commentary on six, five that uh, he took advantage in some way and it wasn't to win. And then number six in which needed some Sally to go away and some Sally to in order to uh, come to terms with his inner self unconscious and conscious activity going somewhere alone to gather again uh, some form of balance then number seven because um, the seven is the number of uh, a certain expertise but solitary and um after coming from having his journey, number six, then he has red feet and a red hat. He's putting together what can arise from the feet and, and, and the crown into one place, which is uh, it's not about community because community cannot reunite the inner being to his highest capacity is mm -hmm. only a space in which to mirror. So here, because he's uh, uniting himself in order to become, uh, to have a, a direct uh, awareness, that's why uh, the outer world is not necessarily backing his oneness. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. his That's his one. his individuation, his individual integration, which is also an individuation that can only be done singularly, mm -hmm. and that's not accepted by community because they it's it's separate. Um, and, sorry, <laughs> I got go ahead, Gilda. I got. So it's five, five and two, the two, the two is, is what's still pending. You know, the crown is red and the shoes are red. He's trying to come together within his, his, from top to bottom. Mm -hmm. You can only do that by yourself. And the fact that he's still looking back towards the tents and so on, you know, something is not quite, quite there that he can do so without being uh, seen as uh, an outsider. Mm -hmm. I think- Yeah, I would interpret it as being, I mean, along similar lines, but you know, when I think about the elements that are there in the card, as well as the, the number and the numerology, you know, all of these cards, um, it, it's particularly helpful to think of them in terms of the tree of life, so. The sevens are correlated to the sphere here, Netzach, the sphere of Venus. And, you know, Venus has to do with desire. Um, and just like, you know, red in terms of color symbolism or color symbology has to do with desire as well. So I kind of formulated this meaning to say that, you know, he's outside of this tent, maybe this man after, you know, warring all day or have retired to their tents to you know mm. have some drinks and have some rest and he's outside and he rather than being logical and saying you know i shouldn't take seven swords and try to carry these things away like what am i going to do with this he succumbs to his his desires and tries to steal these swords and as i say in the slide here it's like how is he going to carry these seven swords i mean where is he going to go with this how is he going to going to avoid detection uh -huh. What the heck is one person going to do with seven swords? I mean, what, is he, what does one even care with that? To me, this is about a particular person. <laughs> I can relate this to a particular person in, in my life, as well as, uh, as well as a part of my own psyche, which is, I think of this as the, I appreciate what Raquel said, and I also, oh, sorry, I'm, uh, Gilda, I appreciate what Gilda said about, because relating it to individuation, sometimes we have to break away, right? But I'm also appreciating, Nick, what you're saying, because that's how I intuitively relate to the card in terms of my own development and also characters I've encountered where the look on his, first of all, the, the background, I never actually thought of that as war tents, which is interesting. I, I did think about what if there's people who need those knives, but I was thinking of it as like a circus. 
And I think that's because that speaks to the part of me as well as the person I'm thinking of in my own life. But if you see the, the man's face, it's, it's almost, a, what's the word? <laughs> Duper's delight. Yeah. Duper's like he's it's not like Gollum with his ring or something. But you know, but I, it's interesting because he's not, it's not a menacing face, but rather a, a duper's delight face where all, like he, he used trickery, but I think that's how they got into the, that place in the first place. I think that's how they got into that tent area. And that is to me what the temptation is in individuation where we have our brain, right? We can use our swords, our mind, representing the mind for good. But we can also use it for evil. We can use charm for things that aren't right. And, but it comes back to us as we'll see in, in eight or eight and nine of swords is, yeah. is that he, he will have experienced the consequences. He's holding it by the blade, first of all. And that doesn't make sense either. Exactly. Great point. Well, and also the, to go right along with that too, you're, you know, beware of under and wisdom. He's looking the wrong way. Because the people yes. he's stealing from actually yes. aren't in the tent. If you look over on the left, way far in the background, they're having a funeral. It looks like the big cross from the side or the big wand, all of them sitting, looking. It's as if their shadow figure in the, on the left there is, is who is being stolen from. And he's about to bump into it going the wrong way. Yeah. Um, he, I, he's, also, oh, there's he's, been a notion he's that great. he's on a stage, um, hmm. that there's this that straight line wouldn't be a road would be a, um, a Masonic stage play as, as it were. I think it's about someone who doesn't, but, but he's taking it lightly. I don't think it's that he's doing this maliciously, but I think that he's taking the severity of his action lightly in a way that will bring, I, I didn't think of it as a funeral, but it could be, it could be maybe the soldiers were hanging out at that circus, right? To relax. Well, maybe, yeah, it, maybe, exactly. Maybe they, maybe they had to uh, go away and they don't even know the swords are gone yet or they, they want to make a plan. Maybe they do know they're gone and they're trying to make a plan about how to catch up with that guy or something. I think the funeral, I think that what you said is legitimate, but I wanted to add that point of view. Um, and I just wanted to ask also, um, well, first I want to reemphasize also that this is about, youth at least this is how I relate to like a certain period of my life where I was doing these things I was using some of my gifts for maybe manipulation my intuitive gifts and sense of people for power plays in my own life socially or something and that really hurt me but I didn't realize the it's sort of like forgive them they know not what they do I didn't really understand that I was like hurting people's feelings or driving people away from me so that's how I relate it to Jung in terms of our individuation. And I'd also like to ask um, how, what do you mean, Nicholas? Um, can you talk a little more about unearned wisdom? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, that's a Jung quote, but I can give some context. I can provide some context for it. Uh, Jung, I, I don't know if it was in this BBC interview or another interview, but he was asked uh, what his thoughts were on the use of uh, psychedelics. And he said, beware of unearned wisdom. Uh, uh, beware of wisdom. You didn't work to gain yourself. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a precarious statement because on the one hand, I do really agree. But I think also Jung was speaking, I, I think it's a, it, the context might be a little bit dated. Um, not to say that I'm advocating the use of psychedelics nor am I necessarily speaking against them, uh, you know, to each their own. But what I am saying is that I think that he was trying to advise people, you know, you, you can gain the same kind of wisdom through natural means and through means that you actually work to achieve rather than just in a kind of convenient six hour, whatever time frame, uh, gain the same amount of wisdom and have no means to integrate it, no foundation to lay that wisdom on. Uh, and that's, I think that's a problem. I think for a lot of modern people who have, you know, have their experiences with psychedelics and plant medicines and things of the sort, you know, people go to these retreats in Peru and go do all of these various things. And it seems like for a lot of people, it's great 
for a very short period of time. Right. You know, it's, they, they come home, they're faced with the world that they left behind, all the same problems await, await them on their doorstep. And, you know, so it really is a kind of, of unearned wisdom. Um, and I think also, you know, I don't know at what point in his life he said this, but, you know, in terms of uh, writers and thinkers who had a lot to say about uh, plant medicines and things of the sort, I mean, Aldous Huxley was his only contemporary that even touched on anything like that. And I don't think that Jung was too terribly fond of Huxley, mm -hmm. but also, you know, just a few short years before Jung's death, um, Albert Hoffman, a fellow, a fellow Swissman, uh, discovered LSD and, you know, things have, uh, all I'm trying to say is that things have changed drastically since then. And now things are moving more in the direction of, regulated use and therapeutic use of these kinds of things. So that's why I say, I think it's a bit, the context of the comment is a bit dated, but the sentiment of the comment remains. I think that, you know, we should all be very careful about wisdom. We didn't work, work to gain. Well, I want can to, I can, I, can I say something here? Uh, uh, the, sure. he's, Go ahead, Gilda, this, please. Yes, thank you. He's going, he is going somewhere, but he's still looking in the rear view mirror. Okay, so he can't get where he's going because it's looking in the rearview mirror. His head is facing back. So that means he's got shadow work that even though through the advancement of the different cards he's earned to move on, he's still caught mm -hmm. in, the, in, in, the, in, in, the, in the back, in the rear view mirror among everything else that he hasn't resolved. And that it's very obvious the, the posture is twisted. He is not looking forward, moving on straight like the Egyptian sculptures are all facing. They're completely solid. Their arms are not out here, over here. Mm -hmm. They're solid looking at eternity. So he's going, going where he needs to go, but he's looking in the rear view mirror. Right. And that's right. the problem. That's why he can't carry all the seven swords yeah, that, he, that he earned. He earned moving in this direction, but he hasn't yet done the cleanup to get there. And the other cards will show this all mm. the way up to the number 10. And the yeah. swords can be the rationalization. If he's stealing <laughs> these, that could be what's weighing him down. For instance, you know, I've, there's been times I've been cruel to other people and I rationalized it because I thought, oh, well, I have been hurt, you know, or I have a, if every time you're rude to someone, you say, oh, well, I have issues with my fam family of origin. This is why I'm be treating you like a jerk. Like, then that's not I fair think, to the other person. I think we need to be careful. Um, and we, in the sense of both you and I and, and most people that, you know, we can, we can rationalize almost anything. You know, yeah, yeah. Very it's easy. a shadow. It's and shadow. Let's, let's hear from Jordan. Okay. Uh, the question, I mean, just to chime in to uh, dovetail, I, I think, I think the sentiment. You're right. Maybe a little dated, but I think it actually is also very current. Because yeah. a quote, a quote I like to use to go with Young's "Beware of Unearned Wisdom," is that quick fixes have shallow roots. Yeah. And so what happens is he has the two swords: practicality, decision left, right, binary, and his male, mm -hmm. masculine, right hand. And he has the trinity of the three in his left feminine side hand. So there's the nature yeah. coming in, but they are all external. He, they, and he's holding them by the blades. So this is, this is that beware of unearned wisdom. You grab a sword by the handle, not by the blade. And so there's, if you, you make priceless mistakes, if you have unearned wisdom and you actually, in this case, you're wielding something too heavy for your own ability. Oh man. What a dichotomy there. Unearned wisdom, priceless mistakes. I, I, yeah, exactly. Well said. Well said. Thank you. Uh, okay. So very quickly, I, I'm just curious if anybody that we haven't heard from. Uh, I'd, like, I'd like to say something about the unearned wisdom also, please, please. which is, um, in Jung's time, there weren't Google and yeah. um, the internet and um, other forms of 
kind of manufactured wisdom, if I can use that term for it. Yeah. And, in, you know, in the instant gratification that people have as far as rationalization and intellectualization. I mean, there's a lot of other problems with the internet and with um, social media and the other new forms of isolation and grasping that we have in our world now. But I think that Jung's quote is one of the best ways to describe the deepest danger. And I think the deepest danger is that unearned wisdom because that's what, and I feel like Nicholas, you were almost saying that before, right? That people are walking around with this belief that they actually understand something or that they've actually experienced something. And so you watch, you know, a matter of heart, right? You watch the Jung movie and suddenly you feel like, oh, I've been in the same room with those people, right? And, and, and I've had that experience, right? Or, or seeing a, a um, documentary about oc the octopus, or a documentary about people, the pygmies, right? And the way that they live. And suddenly you feel like you understand and you have that deeper appreciation and understanding and that it's gonna move you toward your higher consciousness, which it is not. I think it actually is gonna do the opposite. And I think that's what, I think that's what Jung is talking about. Yes, we can, we can definitely get caught in the net. Uh... And that, that is an intended pun, an intentional pun. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I also think that, you know, I, we've said this, I've said this, Skip has said this, I'm sure we have all said this in, a, in our own way at some point or another, but, you know, it's like now we have access to every bit of information in the world, but we are so hungry for wisdom, for actual application of the knowledge. I mean, you know, everything is at our fingertips but are we any smarter for it? No. I don't no, know. I think we're and the arrows. And okay. I think there's a... Um, I, I want to I lay the Bible on you folks here. For oh, can I, can I just slip in a little Buddhist? The information is I, not I, all. All right. But what does so, Annabelle say? Because Yeah. Go ahead, um, uh, Annabelle. So, so Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche wrote a book called Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism. And right from the very beginning of your talk, Nicholas, with this dichotomy, with the dualism, um, and the idea of what the sword is capable of, I think that here when we're talking about the internet and the dangers of it, we're getting very close to that area that Buddhism also is um, addressing that has to do with, we are talking about oneness, even when we're talking about duality, yeah. because when we understand what duality is, when we understand what the sword is capable of, mm -hmm. what the cutting through mm -hmm. um, produces or manifests, then we can, I think, to use the Jung term, mm -hmm. achieve the integration. Yes, and I, I, think, I think also, as I understand it, and you know, it's, my understanding is is relatively small compared to those who have studied Buddhism. So maybe somebody can shed some light on this. Mm. Buddhism is a non-dual philosophy, right? Exactly. So I, I think the distinction between Jung and, and subsequent thinkers that, that are in the school of, of depth psychology and, and Buddhism is that rather than saying, I want to be one with all, I want to be one with the mystery of life. They're saying essentially that you need to separate yourself from the mystery, don't identify with the unconscious, don't let these archetypes swallow you, yeah. wow. do your best to parse out what you can and integrate that into consciousness. But the thing is, I think that there's a, there's a thread that of similarity between each of them, because on the one hand, in the case of, of Jungian thought, I don't think anybody's saying be separate to be separate, if that makes any sense. Right. I, the way that I understand it is, you know, separate these things to really know that you have two halves of a whole rather than to just be identified with the whole at all times. I would love to, to jump in on that because you asked a question that I would like to speak to, um, So, which is about 
um, Buddhism. So uh, I technically belong to a Sangha, but I've also experimented with different religions and I religious science is what speaks the most to me now. And I, uh, I studied the tarot. So I guess I'm an eclectic spiritualist, you know? Um, so in Buddhism, I, I, I think you're right in the sense that you could look at um, Buddha. Well, that's one of the critiques I've heard of Buddhism. Like when I was going to, I went to a couple of church services in college before I became an atheist and um, there was like a youth group and I wasn't into it. So that probably contributed to becoming an atheist at the time. But, but I asked a question to the teacher and, and he was, cause I was saying, I don't think Christianity is the only path though. You know, I, even though I was a Christian, I, I, I was sort of having that contention and he would, his critique of Buddhism is the very thing you said that it was, uh, it was, it's about cutting you yourself off from your desires. Yeah, I mean, it's a really great practice of how to be one with the world, but not necessarily how to be in the world. And so that's what I wanted to speak to. So number one, I, I'm, I want to be clear to the YouTube audience. I'm not, or, or anyone on this panel, like I, I'm not, I'm not speaking against Buddhism. I was just quoting someone else's critique that, that is a valid critique. Okay. Number one, there are people within every religion, every country, whatever, who sort of take that on as a way of critiquing the things that they think are not done well within that religion um, or or country or political stance or whatever. And so there are people doing that with Buddhism. But for me personally, the way to sort of solve that is, um, you know, it's like that some of this ancient wisdom that says things like be in the world, but not of the world, right? Mm -hmm. So the difference between, you know, um, the difference between either going to one extreme where you're, where you're, only living in your, your primal desires, like of addiction, or you're treating other people badly, that's one, um, one way. The other way is holier than thou, right? Of, well, I, I'm better than, than everyone here because I don't participate in all of those things. And then there's like a middle ground, which I think a lot of us who are attracted to tarot are attempting, that it's about um, how to bring spirituality into the everyday in a way that's practical and usable. And that also allows you to make mistakes um, and, and, and then integrate them. Like because of the way I behaved before when I spoke about you know, treating people badly or manipulating, I'm, I'm sensitive now to not doing that because I've experienced how hurtful and isolating it can be to experience mm -hmm. the consequences. So I now consider myself a more compassionate communicative person so I still, I, I did earn that wisdom in the end for yeah. better or for worse. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you for sharing. And I think that that's a, a wonderful example of the, of the earned wisdom, you know, it's really going through the trials and the tribulations rather than just, you know, having a six hour session with a shaman and thinking, you know, it all. Um, well, okay. I, I, I want to hear what Skip has to say on, on the topic of the Bible. And then I do have four more slides. So if we could all hold any comments until the end, I would appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Would you go back to seven again, sure. please, for a minute? Okay. So what this guy has done is he's stolen um, wisdom. He's stolen knowledge, right? And what he hasn't seen yet is what is covered in Ecclesiastes 1, 16 through 18, okay? And so here's what it says. I, com I commune with mine own heart saying, lo, I am come to great estate and I have gotten much wisdom um, or more wisdom than they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know mad madness and folly. I perceive that this also is vexation of spirit for in much wisdom is much grief. And he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. So, you know, maybe it's best not to, um, not to 
<laughs> know everything when you're young um, because um, late. Huh? I said too late. I'm kidding. No, I'm okay, but yeah, I mean, in that sense, when when <laughs> Nicholas kidding. showed the card of the young piercing the king in the heart, saying, "Oh, the young know it all. You've got old." The wisdom was thrown out the window. The experience of the queen was thrown out the window. And it was emphasized that the strength of the young and the new is where is that? Someone who has no experience. Someone who's just blossoming. So that's something I wanted to point out before and I, and I didn't get a chance. Yeah, um, youth will be served often on silver platters. Yes. That's how communism started in China. The youth and forget everything else and I, I don't think that's the case with what is shown in that in that image, nor with what I was saying. Although I, I mean, I understand how how one can arrive at that. But I, what I what I was trying to display was this dichotomy between rigidity and the fluidity of kind of younger knowledge. Where when you're younger, you're not <laughs> set in your ways. You know, I, I one way of interpreting that is you know young hubris, young people thinking where the younger generation and these old fogies don't know what they're talking about. But I interpret it more. And what I think is meant by that image is saying that, like, <sighs> I think it, it's a similar sentiment as to what is expressed by the, uh, the struggles with patriarchy. Now, I don't like to get into this highly charged topic a lot because it's just everyone has a different take on it. But I think it has a lot to do with kind of imagine the old patriarchal kings that we now seek to kind of loosen their views, both, both myself and I think everybody in this group can agree that, you know, the, the forefathers of our country are kind of like these old kings. And it's not so much the hubris of youth, but the more the vision of justice and equality that people yeah. seek to override that with. I so want to. It's, it's not so much a young hubris, but I, I understand. Mm, it's Sorry, good to think of it that way. But communism was started precisely in, like Raquel pointed out, and that probably spells it all. The sword mm. has two sharp sides. Right, yeah, I want okay, to say something. Exactly. I, I do Wait, have that, more slides to get to, so I'd really like to get through these. Yeah. Uh, important. Oh. It's important. But if you would please allow me to get through these last slides. I'm sorry. I, I but it was getting it's 9 30 and I do think that we have more than enough to fill up 30 more minutes with the remaining cards. Right. Okay. So the king of swords here. A calm and stoic king sits squarely upon his throne. He has mastered the turbulent winds of the mind and is prepared to rule over his kingdom, not by might, but with the mind and with the beauty of a butterfly floating on a summer's breeze. Okay. And I, you know, Raquel talked about Athena. I, I kind of saw Athena in this card. So I, I attempted to weave, weave her into the, what I wrote about this card. A wise Athenian queen formed in the winds of time and no stranger to the sword sits upon her throne calling forth those in front of her preparing for judgment and the reception of an edict. Additionally, she is likely calling forth a young man to be knighted. <clears throat> okay, and then the Knight of Swords. The young and bombastic knight rides roughshod into battle and, more generally, the whole of life. Here, the same forces which the king and queen have mastered and derived their power from have not yet been tamed. His sword is unsheathed, young, dumb, and full of gusto, and only just initiated, and much left to learn. There it is. And the page of swords. Uh, so I put he, she in here. It, it was not so much a conscious attempt to be hip to gender pronouns, although it, you know, it can be a both and. But I put the he, she because... I've always heard this card described as it can be either a man or a woman, male or female. And to me, it's not completely clear whether it's a man or a woman in this card. So it, it can be either in this case. Uh, contrasting the figures above, he, she, and the hierarchy of the swords, 
<clears throat> the page is a stranger to the sword, only just now having picked up the sword for the first time. She stands in the countryside, fantasizing of one day being able to wield the sword of great power. However, it is just that, a future vision, a hope, and an imagination, but not without good reason. Okay, so that is the end of what I have prepared. And um, we can go over any final comments or anything anybody has to say. I know uh, I'm sure some people have I, I have a number of interesting cards to show people, <laughs> including the one Gilda wanted us to show. Uh, but, but go ahead, let, let you Ooh. wrap up first and then I'll come back to Gilda. I wanted to comment about the page that you mentioned, the he or okay. she. Mm -hmm. It is obvious in stylistically in the way it is drawn that the clothing is that of a male and not a female. Like because, a tunic, right? Yes, or it would be a female would have a dress. I mean, that's the way it is simply designed throughout the cars. A female is not shown wearing a short tunic uh, right below her crotch. Okay, well, forgive my ignorance. I didn't realize it was so obvious. Yeah, it's obvious to me. I, I study fashion, so. <laughs> okay, great. Well, and I think in, the, in that regard, I, uh, but the Page of Swords, it's interesting to me that That's the way it is. Is, is, that a, is that a little de demon shadow behind the head, or is it just a ponytail that's shadowed by the sword? Um, it's almost like a little bitty thing that has eyes um, coming out of the back of his head. If you, if you zoom in to that piece, it literally looks like an octopus demon kind of thing. Yeah, it's serious. Like a loose, loose piece of hair. Well, like a shadow figure, though, like a, um, that's emerged. Mm. Mm -hmm. what are... mm. um, can I talk about that Seven of Swords for a moment since sure. we're wrapping up? Cool, thanks. So what I wanted to speak to earlier, because I, I think it's important, um, Nick, in, in the comment you made, because you mentioned patriarchy. And I like to find a way to connect what we're looking at, what I look at in tarot with my life, right? And also what we're talking about in this class with how it, how it applies to the world that we're living in, you know, for the audience and everything. And for me, I um, just to be clear, the, optical, what, the image that I was talking about was this this image here, not not the seven of swords. OK, but the concept the, still applies. Yeah, okay. it's, it doesn't really matter which card. Um, but what I wanted to speak to is isn't the um, there's this idea that when you, I'm, I'm a little less familiar with alchemy. So so I would ask this, but isn't the idea of that idea of there's a killing of the king or something like this, right? But aren't, aren't you taking on the king's power by doing that? Yes, and it's not so much a killing of the king just for the sake of killing the king. So right. just take, take this in, and, and note that there's a young a youth here slaying the old rigid Synax. Right. And, and in this following image, later in a similar series of alchemical engravings, the king and queen are then united. So on the right here, you see this androgynous figure oh both, the, and that both women so it's not mm -hmm. just killing just to kill it's just yeah, like it's not yeah. just a rigid masculine view it's that it, it both sides need to be incorporated yes well both i'm not speaking physical. about i only wanted to to make a bridge to another point that actually wasn't about gender but uh, you refer, referred to patri patriarchy and it's it's interrelated it is interrelated with gender because we're talking about the patriarchy but it's mm -hmm. not I wanted to make a leap to another point. Do you want a seven of? of uh, no, seven? no, no, no. This is this is fine. Um, what I was going to speak to is I believe um, that I'm relating this to tarot because you know you mentioned alchemy, and from what I understand, that there's something about uh, there's something about or or just like in that in that psychological sense where they say you know you want to kill your opposite gendered parent and you want to you know marry your, your same gendered parent um 
the killing in a case like that, and from what I understand in alchemy, has more to do with um, the symbolism of I want that person's power, right? The electric complex is you're jealous of a, a woman, a girl being jealous of her mother for the affection of her father. It's because she, the father, um, never relates to the, the partner in, with the same type of love, and some would argue with as strong of a love to their children as to their partner. And the same thing with um, a, a child wants, uh, the child wants to be like his father. The male child wants to be like his father and be grown up and have power and the undying love of his mother and she doesn't want it to go to anyone else, even if it's the dad. That's the psychological concept it's speaking to. So the way I wanted to connect that with what you said in the page, you mentioned patriarchy is because I feel like those things that we're trying to quote, kill it, it, like in this country, right? They can't be killed off completely. It's about absorbing what worked, right? It's about, I would rather have had our, our current president be our president than some crazy female president. Like I'm not gonna vote for someone just because of their gender, mm -hmm. but at the same time, just like we need to look at our shadow and our personal individuation and psychology in order to evolve and move forward in our own lives. I think that it's harder to look at the systems that benefit you. So what I'm saying is I encounter that where with, um, with other liberal people, even around issues with racism, I've encountered it in conversations that I attempt to have with the men are about gender equality because it feels uncomfortable to look at unearned privilege, just like unearned wisdom. But I think we have to look at it just like, I'm glad, uh, our, I think our forefathers were, were racist, you know, slave holding people. I also think they were brilliant. I also think that, you know, the, the good ideas in the constitution should remain, but I, mm -hmm. I also think there's a lot of problematic things that have come up in that last, uh, under the Trump presidency and we're still dealing with because he was essentially pardoned you know, that, that we have to confront. And I believe we confront it more so on an individual level. So because you're a man and you make a comment like that about patriarchy, I just want to mention that I think it's important because you're the youth, you're the younger generation that's going to be looking at what you inherited and deciding if you want to be on the side of justice or if you want the system to be the same. Right. Well, I mean, it's not for nothing that I've included all of this. Right. Uh, you know, we think it's interesting that they have at the belly a little X and, and the angel has a little X and the other one also has something in the belly. It's almost pointing to, to that being a very important location. Yeah. yeah. Where the Hara, the center of our energy resides. Right. Actually, that would be the navel. The horror would be lower. Um, I'm curious on the right. It's That's interesting, the, the, about, the right? vertical crown. Um, and then the, the unified person, the complete capital S self, man and woman, the masculine and feminine energies, is handing the crown off to the right unconscious side, which is now that they're together, the, basically the child has become the parent of the man or the woman. So that the right of initiation is now not to be knighted or be knighted to be in the night. Um, it's now to be crowned sovereign. With right. The yeah. And I mean, I think that to follow up on what you were saying, Samantha, I mean, and also Gildo's comment that it's not so much just this murder of the king or just this killing of the king just to kill him you know, just, this is a different series, this one that I have my cursor on here on the right, mm -hmm. but it's pretty much true that in every alchemical series, which the king is killed, he's later reunified with his counterpart. So it's not so much in the, in the context of what we're talking about with patriarchy and our forefathers and stuff. It's not looking to them and just saying, you guys had it all wrong. We're going to kill everything. That I you agree. Before. It's saying that some of it was great, some of it was right, some of some of what you represented are the very things that my entire life is built upon, and some of it is completely wrong. We're gonna so, take forward the wrong, and you know, you can think of it as like maybe the male was like an extremely thinking, um, systematic, 
kind of uh, approach to a government body, to a collective body. And then also, you know, it was one-sided because it was extremely rigid. And yeah. then to kill that off would be to kill the rigidity and also marry that to unite that with something that's a little more oriented to feeling to, to the feminine, something that's more balanced. Yeah. So, so what I I'm specifically speaking to, and I heard everything you said, but is I, I for me, it's about, I'm relating this back to wait, you can stay on that image. Cause that that's right. interesting. I'm, re, I'm talking about, Oh no, no, no. The other one, the guy had a dark face that, that stood out to me. Cool. I don't know what that represents. I don't want to ask a question about it yet, but I want to make my point <laughs> that, that it's about, for me, I'm talking specifically about race and how your generation is going to deal with white privilege specifically because that is a system that benefits you. And, and that is, and I, and I bring this up specifically because I feel like we're not going to evolve as a country and even just in our individual, our individual paths, unless we deal not just with, you know, we want to look at class, we, we sort of are comfortable dealing with gender issues, but I feel like we're not, talking about that because it's so uncomfortable for a lot of people my age and your age. I feel like a, a lot of white people to admit that they have privilege. It doesn't feel good to do. Uncomfortable for me at all. Okay. Well, I think privilege is not only color and race. I mean, yeah, there is me, an enormous but, amount of but things I'm talking that about go here. Race. But I'm talking about specifically race. And that, that's the, okay. that's the conversation. Samantha. Samantha. Wait, can I finish my thought? I, I, I'm saying the conversation, that's the part that people don't want to talk about that I believe is problematic. Yes, there's all sorts of privilege, but the racial privilege that I'm talking about, that is, that is the part of our country that has allowed the people in power to remain in power as long as they have. So yes, I'm specifically talking about skin color. I'm specifically talking about white privilege, people who look light or ambiguous like you and me, and then people who are obviously black like George Floyd. That's why I'm bringing it up. Okay, um, we're gonna go back to the to the tarot now. Uh, <laughs> that is not the tarot to me because we had a conversation where we tangented into talking about that. Well, okay. So it look, is. Look. Skip, would you would you mind repeating the the Bible passage that you pulled in? I I feel it got muddied, and I I, I thought it was appropriate, and I'd like it to come back in the presentation if possible. Yeah. I will, but um, you know, Samantha, um, these problems are replayed in every generation. Uh, it's not it's not so easy as to say, well, if everybody would just believe in equality, uh, w we would be done. You know, the founding fathers knew that there was a huge problem with slavery um, and the inequality that it represented. They knew it. They called it the wolf. Um, okay, but they knew but, it and they but, didn't do anything about they, it. And so what I'm Samantha, saying is, even today, you, Samantha, even you can't today, do everything. Okay, you but you don't want me to talk about race. You want me? You said get back to the tarot. That's what I'm talking about. There are a lot of liberal, well-meaning people who don't want to talk about white privilege because it's comfortable. It's uncomfortable, and when I bring it up, it's treated as taboo. Samantha, to be fair, I think that we all can agree that everything that you're saying is valid and it has its place and yes. we're willing to talk about it, but we're here to talk about tarot. Right. Okay. And, and so, so, I'm saying, I can so Samantha, off. if you want to have a conversation tomorrow about race, I'll have a conversation. No, with you no, about I don't, race. I don't, no, no. Online, I'll live class. online. I'm going to leave class. I, I, I have actually a client that I need to be working with and I came to this class. I'm going back and forth between you guys. Okay. So what I want to say though, as I'm leaving under, under protest, because I don't think you, you guys say that. And I've heard that in every class where I brought this up is you guys say, yeah, Samantha, you know, we're talking about tarot, but this is an extension for me. I'm a tarot practitioner who is a, a person of color who this affects my life. This is, affects my okay. life. Okay, so I, Samantha, what so, would you have have us do about it? No, I just, I just, I just. What should we do about there's it? Nothing. I just want you to hear what what I have to say, and I don't. I, I feel like people are responding to my being kind of angry or, imp or impassioned, and I just want people to hear it without it being um 
I just want to express my opinion. That's all. That's okay. what, that's what I believe. So you, you it's important. Done. You have done it yep. now. You thank can you. go to, go and to your you. client. Yes, thank okay. you. All right. Uh, so in response to um, in response to Jordan, um, the biblical passage is Ecclesiastes 1, 16 to 18. And um, thank you. And I was given it by um, Tim Holmes, who had it in a show that he did. But um, I communed with my own heart, saying, Lo, I am come to great estate and have gotten much wisdom, than, or more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I gave my heart to know wisdom and, I, and to know madness and folly. I perceived that this also is vexation of spirit. For in much wisdom is much grief and he that increases knowledge increases, increaseth sorrow. So, um, thank you. What what I would say is that, you know, throughout history, we have faced these issues time and again, and and it, it's partially because young people have to learn about them and be educated about them because were born as tabula rasa. And, um, and so we have to learn and study about them. But to say that we have no progress is not correct, okay? Uh, because uh, I've lived through plenty of things in the civil rights movement, plus and minus, and what I know is that the, that the lot of black people today is far better than it was in 1968 when I graduated from college. Now to say that it's perfect, it is not perfect. Uh, it's not even close to being perfect, but we have been working on it as a project of society for actually for centuries and um, you know, going back to the to the uh, people who who went to end slavery in the South, who you know promoted um, you know fighting uh, for the freedom of the slaves to begin with, and hundreds of thousands of white people who did that as a as a matter of religious faith, you know the, the Battle Hymn of the Republic is actually the last 20 or so verses of Revelation, which is the end of the Bible. And right. so, so there, were, there were literally hundreds of thousands of white people who ended slavery. And, and others have been trying to pull it back, and it has been pulled back. And in many ways, we just call it for-profit prisons now. <laughs> but uh, but that's a different topic than this is tonight. Can I share um, something about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, go ahead, go ahead. The white long ago, the um, white, powerful, uh, blonde were slaves. They were actually coveted by the Arabic nature. I can't tell exactly which. Uh, Babylon, whoever they were, the kings of the Middle East, because they were strong and, and, and excellent warriors. So they were the slaves and they were blonde. They were kidnapped and brought into, uh, and they're, they are the ones that are the maids to those people. And they're white. Well, so, I mean, you know, and... this has been going on. So now the table's on, on the other side. But uh, I, I, in some places, uh, and I do have friends that are Turkish, and their maids and the nannies are white. And they are uh, dark haired kind of tan people. They're not black per se, but uh, they take the whites 
as the lower kinds of jobs. We're at a time in history at the first point where a conquered country does not become slaves, enslaved. I mean, this is all, all previous times in a way, every country would come in and take the assets and the assets were the people too. Um, so in the 20th century, it's the first time that a conquered country or someone who lost, lost the war is not enslaved. Now they may be for profit prisons or like we did to Germany with uh, the Treaty of Versailles, impoverish them to, you know, and that there's all different kinds of the semantic of what is slavery. But I, I th- and I think, again, it's the topic of tarot. And in the tarot, there's, there is really no gender identification. No, there it's isn't. sacred masculine and sacred mm-hmm. feminine that yeah. exists within each and every person. Yeah. Um, I do appreciate the melanized tarot, which then brings all the characters into color because uh, then the dark is a demonized, it's shadow. And that's, that's mm-hmm. an important distinction. But other than yeah. that, I think it sticks to a Jungian topic and yeah. not a racial topic. We agree with I, that. I really want to hear from Raquel here. She's had her hand raised for. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Um, I just wanted to make a few points about everything that's been said, but um, kind of talking in a metaphor uh, and about Tarot, actually, because I think that the suit of swords is actually a confrontation of one individual with the system of thought, you know, the system of thought that you were raised on and you actually believed in, and it's a part of you, and you have to work with the system in order to change it. So when you live in a, in a society that you want to change, you have to always think how that is structured is actually influencing your own thoughts and what you're doing because it's really um it's difficult to be politically active and a militant and you know join joining a, a political party and everything because you can get lost in the idea that you have to change society and you have to change others um, when actually the story of the suit is about um, the problem of changing yourself and the problem of changing your um, patterns of, of thoughts, you know, and I get it what Samantha is talking about, but I have to say as a person that uh, was not raised in uni- in United States, but as a person that was raised in a country that actually knows the story of of United States because we just simply have to because you know all of the um, cultural existence of United States inside of Brazil it's so ov- overwhelming that we cannot run away from you guys so it really strikes me as kind of impressive of how little you guys know of the history of other countries. It's like, uh, Skip knows uh, the history of other countries because Skip actually lived with other people and lived and breathed other cultures and alongside uh, other people. And it's, those topics about race and slavery, I mean, if you not actually know the history context of what that uh, was, it's, you know, oh, but there always existed and this and that, that's just historically inaccurate. Therefore, therefore, it's kind of false to just say, oh, but there are other people, white people were once enslaved, but that's never the same type of slavery that we're talking about. And so you, you kind of have to have this, and it's not about actually changing anything. I'm not saying that you guys are actually um, wrong or bad or anything like that, but there's a type of sensitivity that sometimes is lacking, you know, that you just don't know. That, that's mm-hmm. all. And that's okay not knowing. I'm not saying that you guys are, are bad people or wrong for not knowing, but you just don't know. And if you don't know, 
why say it you know yeah our, yes our problem, so well said and our problem is that we don't even have news about other countries any longer right our and, new our news is devolved into an ongoing right left debate without any news from around the world none okay and even it's Mark so Twain, a hundred years ago, said the cure for racism is travel, because then you know when in Rome you go and you do as the Romans do, and when I'm in France I do that, and I learn by acclimating and steeping in the culture that I'm experiencing, not bringing oh can't you see it my way? I try to forget myself as much as possible and take the opportunity to see how a whole other group of people has come to evolve to now. Yeah, and we, you're, we, we're changing all the time too. For example, um, you know, I had, I had uh, 6,000 Indian, mostly women employees in my company um, when I was active in India. And I never once thought about them as being slaves. I worked with them because it was lower cost to work with them in India than it was to work in the United States. It, all, it, it had only that, but, but my company was entirely dependent on their work. And, and you know, I would not have, um, you know, said anything negative about those women um, or done anything negative about them. They didn't have employment before I came. And, and so, and the same happened in Japan. I, you know, I built a company that was largely women, um, but they were Japanese women, <laughs> completely different race. Uh, and I never once thought about their race in terms of anything about white privilege. I was bringing something to their country that their country didn't have, and they mm -hmm. selected to work with me. Okay. It wasn't a, a slave owner re relationship. It was employer employee relationship, but I, you know, and I did have to change a lot of opinions uh, about things. Um, but I also understand, can I say something, that when sure. a country is powerful, whenever any ruler is the one that stands out and it's in front of everyone's face for them to criticize, to say, to do it, then they're going to get it. They're going to get it from every single angle, whether right. some things are true or some things are not. Yeah, and sure. as a matter of fact, I'm not American. I am a Spanish speaking person, so um, I know precisely what Raquel is saying, but I also, I am well aware, and I wasn't born in this country, that there is uh, white slavery and uh, have been white slavery in other places. I mean, this is historical. You can well, just and, look it and up. Even my ancestors, and it is it's slavery even, to even, a certain way. So. My ancestors who came to New Amsterdam when there were 150 people here, a man, a woman, and their three sons. They were five of the first 150 people in Manhattan, but they were indentured. Okay, they were in effect slaves, but contractual slaves. In other words, right. they, had, they had to do their service and then they could be released to do their own thing, but they had to do their service first. And so in effect, you know, they, you know, so, you know, <laughs> what it's do more we about say? power. What do, yeah. Than so about what? Do, yeah. I mean. So what color. do we say about them? You know, they clean. They cleared the trees north of Wall Street, north of the Wall. Okay. They cleared the trees and made farms there, north of the Wall. Okay. In New York City, what is today New York City, and the boundaries of their their farm were the East River, the Wall. Division Street, I believe it's Division Street, and um, I, I forget what the westernmost boundary is, but it, there were five, there were six Bowery's, six farms 
across north running north to south and and it was basically white slaves that went and, and created those farms cleared those trees that now are you know now there are buildings that are 200 years old or 150 mm -hmm. years old right oh, yeah. um, and and so we, what am i supposed to say about that um, <laughs> <laughs> well, and I appreciate the power of Raquel's statement because it, it does go without saying. And Skip, you, you hit the nail on the head that even our media, even if if I don't go and look for myself, if I just only watched our quote unquote news, which it's not news anymore because there's no journalism in it. There's the weather, there's the killings and there's sports. And it has nothing to do with art, culture or anything intellectual or academic or at all. Um, and that fact that we as a culture in America do not en masse receive basically education of, hey, what's going on across that pond, the Atlantic? What's going on across the big pond in Oz? I mean, other than who has the best COVID record, I mean, these days, and that's still the we're number one America sports motto, not an actual cultural manifesto for the use of the wrong word most probably there um but i think that whole um piece where there's a narcissistic persona that america per portrays as a whole not everybody I mean, everyone in this group i think it's like oh look a person my favorite you well, know there's a, so. there's a narcissistic persona but basically we're all ignorant i mean most right. americans that you see outside of the United States mm -hmm. are in bus tours of right. all the usual sites, right? They're not, right? they're not people that can participate in the society at all that they're visiting. They, they just can't and they don't want to. And you why is that? Them. We want to know why I, that is. I, I would really like to jump in here and just say, I, I don't know that there's, there's much that we can say mm -hmm. beyond what Raquel said. I really think that she said all that that can be said and anything beyond that is just us just going back and forth about the yeah, yeah. Americans. Yeah, so we're grinding the sword. Thank down. you for wh wh yeah. whipping out the sword, I think, Nick. Yeah, the horse all is right. dead. Let's so, stop kicking it. Okay, Nick, so. Nick, I think I think there is something else about this, though, which does get exactly back to this sword deck, which is that and, and Skip talking about your own family this way. And it turns out some of the things you said connect with some things about my family. My ancestor, Matthew Perry, opened Japan. I have often thought about what that really means. He was buried at St. Mark's Church in the Bowery. Um, uh, my mother's family came over on one of those 1600s ships. These things that we examine about ourselves and about our own histories and about who we are and what we bring to the world, I think that's what this sword deck, what I've learned tonight, is about. And it's not about all of us saying everybody is doing one thing or another thing. When Jordan spoke about going to a country and living, living like the Romans in Rome, that's how I go to Rome. But I also worked in Rome. I also worked in Munich and I had to, you know, speak the German and be in the office and work with the people who were there and then bring them to New York and have them have a German speaking office. And the various things we've done, I think we're a kind of unique group because we're searching into these deeper meanings. But I think the, what the sword suit is showing us, it's each of us pursuing our own journey of understanding knowledge where yeah, we Yeah, there, there's so many things, attention. there's so many things that are overlaid on, on various issues. For example, mm -hmm. okay, I'll share, I'll share a screen here. This will blow your mind. Uh, I'd really like to, after we see these images that you've prepared to also do our best to go through the comments on YouTube, because it does seem like that there's a lot there. And, and <laughs> well, I have been trying to respond over there, except for the last yeah. few minutes, but um, Great. I see, me... I, as I'm thumbing through, I see just in case 
says the young knight coming to her rescue, however, is rather immature and flimsy. Touche. <laughs> All right, just in case. I'll take that on the nose, but I will also have you know that I was not saying literally that's the case. I'm alluding to the fact that that's also a mythological and a fairy tale motif that represents something. I think much more sophisticated than a young knight needing to save a damsel in distress. Well, his unconscious is in distress. He's having a psychic event. So he's rushing back to take care of himself. And from an individuation perspective, take care of his inner feminine. Yes, but yeah, okay. Justin. Otherwise he can't go to the queen because the queen would not accept a puerile. You know, he has to go self mature before he could become king yes and uh, after skip shares his images here i would like to go through and do our best to respond to anything that we can in here okay just a sec. okay there i found it okay <clears throat> all right so here's what i learned in saudi arabia i'm going to show you Okay, the second time I went to Saudi Arabia, um, my colleague, another American colleague, wanted to get Saudi attire. And so we went to, believe it or not, the haberdashery row in Riyadh is literally right, it's within... 150 feet of where they chop people's heads off, okay, in Dera, in Riyadh. And the first time this happened, on my second trip, I've been there 23 times. On my second trip, my friend said that he wanted a thobe. And so our host said, oh, well, I'll buy you a thobe. And so he took us down there and he bought us thobes. And we we on a on condition that we would wear them the next day which we did and uh we felt ridiculous to begin with but what we found was that the saudis loved it loved the fact that we were wearing saudi attire okay so i made it my practice uh for the next uh 21 and a half trips to wear this attire okay but then uh, I went to a trade show in Dubai and I was wearing the thobe and actually it's because I was in a, in a booth of a Saudi uh, organization, I won't say which one, and I was in their booth and I was wearing Saudi attire and afterward there was a party and we were all going to go on the, to the party on a bus and so we went to the party on the bus and I get off the bus and there's not a soul wearing a thobe, no Saudi, nobody. Okay. And, and so I said, whoops, I'm not in the right attire here. I think I'll go back to the hotel. And I got back on the bus and went back. And that's because I was in a, in a Shia uh, community and Saudi Arabia is Sunni. And so I had to learn that lesson the hard way that yes, in Saudi Arabia, they love, love it if I dress this way, but not in, um, not in Dubai. And in fact, they have signs in restaurants and stuff saying no national dress. You're not allowed to wear national dress in Dubai or in, in the Emirates. Um, and so each of those countries has a different attitude about it. And so here I am learning these things about a, a new culture in a discerning kind of way, you know, where I learn, uh, first of all, the Saudis love that I dress that way, but oh, by the way, the Emiratis don't. <laughs> <laughs> but I had to learn two different ways. And so that's the discernment. But anyway, we should go back to the uh, to swords the here. And uh, Gilda wanted to look at um, the Toth deck. 
And so let me. So Nick, where are we in terms of your presentation? How would you like to proceed? Are you done, Nick? Yeah, I'm done. I actually, I have a question for Gilda. I, since we had some back and forth about the gender of the page, I'm curious. I was actually basing what I had to say on Crowley's formulation for the court cards because doesn't he do um, princess knight, knight yeah. in prince, mm -hmm. princess mm -hmm. in place of the page? Yes, but you were mm -hmm. showing that image. So yeah. if you're going to show a symbol of image that has uh, pieces that are symbolic representations, then, and, uh, and I'm looking at this symbolic representation, which is obvious from that time, wearing a male outfit, uh, I was just going by the symbol that is very clearly displaying something, not that, yeah. that, 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 that pages are only male per se. Right. I know that we just... talked about before, I, you, you mentioned and seemed to show some f familiarity with the Golden Dawn and their teachings and stuff. And I, I, if you know Crowley, you know that he was involved with the Golden Dawn as well. So mm -hmm. it's my understanding that both Arthur Edward Waite and Crowley had access to this secret tarot that the Golden Dawn used that they only allowed their initiates to see. Obviously, it's not so much of a secret anymore, uh, but in that version of the tarot, it was actually arranged where it was knight, queen, prince, princess. And princess, yeah. And the same formulation is there in the Rider Waite deck. It's just hidden in the fact that the page is kind of looks like a man and a woman. Mm -hmm. So I could be wrong. I mean, you know, that's you know, just conjecture, right? Honest, but, but that's how I interpret it. The, let's say if 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 uh, someone is. is creating a tarot now mm -hmm. and they uh well let's say a few years back now it's hard to say who's wearing a skirt or what and they display that uh page um wearing a short mini skirt with you know it, it's definitely using that symbol to display something related to the times whether it's hidden or not is mm -hmm. still symbolically uh well, to the times and displayed. the individual and, and the artist. Yeah, the yeah, artist Yeah, because, I mean, back displayed. then, men were men and we wore mini skirts. Oh, I'm sorry, tunics. You know, right, I mean, it's exactly. It was the opposite. The women wore these long dresses and the men wore tights and short skirts. Has right. anyone here seen Game of Thrones? I'm no, sure I, I haven't. I, you know, to me. Oh, a little. Have you seen it? What is what is the young girl's name? That's like I don't, I the, don't. the kind of tomboyish girl. That's I don't own it. Aria. Aria. There you go. Oh, yeah. I kind of imagine her as the page. You know, like <laughs> she right. present immediately as being a very feminine yeah. uh, younger girl, although mm -hmm. she obviously is. And, and okay, but, well, know. I want. I have a few uh, decks that I want okay, to show. Great. One, great. one was great. requested by Gilda, and the purpose of this exercise is to show that there are very, very different perspectives. So if, as it's anybody exactly. who's been listening to us different paths. Uh, clearly knows that, that we all have different perspectives on these cards and any diviner who's a, a reader will give you a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And and it's up to you to decide what applies to you and what doesn't. And so Gilda mentioned the Toth deck and the actually the Queen of Swords and the Toth. So what I did was I treated the Ace as the um, as sort of the definitive card, and uh, the Queen I brought up for uh, Gilda's idea. So here's the Toth deck, the Ace of swords, again, we see the ace, the sword uh, piercing the crown, right? Uh, so it's discernment, but you wanted to talk about this beautiful card, Gilda, so. Yes, because she cut, she's holding the head on her hand. Right. <laughs> that means the head is, is severed and there's a certain unity uh, rhyming in the heavens that is encompassing uh, the female as as well as the intellect right but but she has cut the male part of the intellect and she's holding it in her hand because that is a male figure 
that she's mm-hmm. the head of a male that she's holding. Yeah, it's, it's got, got a, beard. a beard, okay? So maybe, maybe I mean, can you tell me that that's not a male that could be a female? I mean, it's got a beard. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, right? So it, it's saying that um, the oh, head is Russia. cut up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I understand. I've had dreams in, in which uh, I write dreams every day, right? Females throwing kids at me, this and that, and then suddenly I see them in my house and they have this beard, like, oh, it fooled me. It's, it's a male, not a female. So here, the male, she's the male part of the rationale, since the swords represent the ra- rationale, is, is held on the side of the right, the left hand. Okay, it's her left hand, right? So, and she's a female. So there's right. a unity about about the entire thing that rhymes in the heavens right. as complete. It's, it's kind of like a complete manifestation of 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 um, uh, an elevated uh, resolution. Of right, and the spiritual spirit. the spiritual yes. is up here. Mm-hmm. And it's head. geometric, it's it's the crystal, there's still something around it. She has a sword. The sword is in her right hand. She used the sword in order to cut off that rationale and separate it in order to become uh, at one with the sky and and right. the uh, expansion of it. And she's elevated. It is an right. elevated way of being. Right. And she's also back in that posture of the posture of she herself is the scales is the scale of justice yes that's very right. good yeah. yes thank yeah. you I, I i didn't i you should never connect it the way yeah mm-hmm. okay Your posture, so right? so uh, there's a couple more that i want to show you one is the she wolf cards and uh let's see if i have them here okay uh because we throughout this process have been talking about two decks in particular which are the she wolf deck and the uh, Starman deck. So I'm going to show you the same cards in uh, She Wolf and uh, Starman, and read the read their write-ups. Okay, which uh, can be somewhat different. So here I'm going to read about the Ace of Swords, um, which is on the left, and um, she said, and this is Divani Wolf has written this. She says, uh, keys, brilliance, mental clarity, piercing realizations, artwork illumination. A woman holding a wand of selenite actively prays at an altar of awakening. Selenite is a wonderful conductor, helping to sift through muddled, confusing thoughts. At the altar is an all seeing eye representing the opening of higher intellect and the symbol of Hathor, the ancient Egyptian goddess for love and fertility. Now is the time for the seeds of ideas blooming into big things. The light side of this, the signs of air are ruled by the intellect, the mind, ideas, one of the key ethereal places where we place emphasis on the self. Although thoughts are not what who we are, the ones we pay attention to are the ones that grow. The more they grow, the more we identify with them and they begin to manifest outwardly, the law of attraction. So there is a great deal of power here. When we receive this card, we are being asked to use this power wisely to see the opportunity for clarity and take it. This may also suggest that after a time when much is confusing and frustrating, we finally had a domino effect of realization, allowing us to perceive with sharpness a truth that was hidden. We can take on a new stance, climb up to a new height and see with new eyes. Shadow, with any intellectually based card like this, we run the risk of blotting out the emotional aspects of our decision-making. The mind isn't the only entity on the panel, and we want to make sure we are listening to heart and spirit as well. Otherwise, we may become cold and distant in our approach. Mantra, I grow the seeds of my ideas with tenderness. Um, 
Mm, that's very nice. Thank you. And then uh, this is interesting about uh, the Queen of Swords too, uh, since it's so much like the Toth in a way. Um, and it's also like the Ace of Swords where the sword has become her. Yeah. The cloud hand. Right. And, and so here it's about uh, keys are overcoming obstacles, perspective, strength, ideals, clear perception. Uh, and so what I would say is we're all in the clouds kind of uh, even the people that are watching on YouTube, and we have to figure out where we are at any given time. So the artwork illumination, high above the clouds as if they are her home, a woman kneels gracefully overlooking heavenly space. There is not much else occurring with the exception of Venus making a soft appearance, and there doesn't need to be. She is the queen of the air element and high above it all, uh, is where she belongs. Here she has more than a bird's eye view. She has the perspective of the tallest mountain of the stratosphere, even the, si the stars. Light, when we are neck deep in a situation that is nearly impossible to gain perspective from it. When we have had some time and distance away, however, new thoughts and outlooks come into being. Up close, everything seems large and we can become overwhelmed by many details. From a distance, everything appears smaller and nuances don't matter as much. Perspective is so important for our peace of mind. Uh, it is crucial to have boundaries that, we feel, that feel good, serving our highest and healthiest ideals. When this queen arrives in a reading, we are being asked to take a step back or up from the situation at hand and gain more insight into all elements involved. Our clarity right now depends upon it. The shadow side to be high up in the clouds is perhaps uh, to be unreachable. Boundaries are quite necessary and healthy for our well being and the defying unfurling of our relationships with others but too many boundaries can create a fortress and make us completely inaccessible. We must be careful not to be cold with others simply because we want to remain strong. There is so much strength in vulnerability too. Just don't give it all away up front. And mantra, a clear perspective comes from taking a step back. Um, so that's the mantra mm. that she talks about. Mm -hmm. any, any comments on these two cards? Is it just me or is it getting hot in here? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, oh, it's, man, I, I don't know. I was like, wow. <laughs> if you happen to see the most beautiful girl in the world, tell her I love her song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we find it interesting that also the, the one from the top, also the woman... Uh, even though it is the swords, she's her breasts are showing, so right. that means that she her heart is opened for uh, nurturing. And she is unveiled. I mean, she right. has the yeah. the nudity of a star. Stars need no veil, you know. Yeah. So, right. yeah, but it's interesting that the card, especially the Queen of Swords um, of the She Wolf deck, is talking about ban boundaries. And she's up in the sky, you know, and when you, you know, in, in the middle of the sky, you don't really have boundaries. So it's, I think it's a hard lesson for the card somehow. It's, it's not going to be easy to, to, to separate, you know, being on that state, even though she may be open to, to new experience. Uh, she might be open to everything, you know, she might not have any type of security or guard or whatever, you know. And that's a good point, because then up where she is, she's in the top of the ivory tower, so to speak, um, where she, she, the only thing there is herself. So yeah, the boundary because, is a fiction in a way. Yeah. And I think that the, the, the third suit, you, you always have some type of weapon, you know, 
with with the the main character of the card so she the the person can do something you know and in this card it's nothing it's just her you know and well then the, she in, in hasn't the back, it she herself has become her own weapon in that sense queens are natural leaders so she would delegate the weaponry well, to her I, subjects it, mind yeah, you but, it's it's the feminine please because um you know i'm i'm the o- only male executive in the world that has um, uh, made a million dollar sale wearing a full length evening gown. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) There it is. Who who do you know? What man do you know that has worn a full length evening gown and made made sales? Hey, Nick, now it's really getting hot in here. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> okay, let, <laughs> let me move on to the star man because that's nice. that's also. A, a, I a agree different... with Raquel. Yeah, I the... thought the the ace yeah. of swords of the she wolf deck was is powerful in what she said, but when 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 I looked at the queen of swords, I I, I couldn't find the 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 warrior that that rose yeah. or anything. It was well, it's very vulnerable. It, yeah, yeah there's also there's kind of an enigmatic quality where it's as if well, she herself it, has become the very strong, story. Gilda. It's very strong, right? Because you don't have to have a sword to be strong. She yeah, looked she naive. She weapon. looked naive and sort of yeah. vulnerable. Look at the men are getting all heated up. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. And, she disarmed and us. She, and she kind of, she's the archetype of like, here she, I am. Uh, yeah, she wouldn't surrender her power. You know, she no. would. She's the one in charge there. I yeah. Mean, no, no doubt. And and mm-hmm. so, um, yeah, I mean, all I'm doing is showing different perspectives here. So one more. Mm-hmm. But um, I really enjoy the Ace of Cups. Or the, or the Ace of Cups is very powerful. Uh, Ace of Swords, you mean that? The, yeah. yeah, the Ace of Swords of yeah. the she mm-hmm. was very powerful. Okay, well, yeah, walking I, up here, the temple here, steps. Here's an... Uh, an even more powerful image from a masculine point of view. Um, and so let me see how I can do this. Um, all right, this is from the Starman Tarot. And here's the Ace of Swords looking even more powerful. <laughs> no people in it, but anyway. All right, I will, let me read this briefly. Could you zoom in just a little bit? Yeah, I was going to ask the same. Yeah. Thank you. All right. We'll zoom on in on the ace first. I don't know. There's no actual writing there at the bottom. So there, there it is. Okay. Time is arrived for a significant breakthrough, the creation of a conscious intentional space in which to have a powerful insight. Conscious understanding brought to a particular issue is expanded with a clear, unique thought or new inner voice. The result is rejuvenating, a fresh new beginning or approach to life with a renewed vision of your purpose. In this artwork, a sword is seen floating in the space of pure potential beyond a golden circle through which the matrix of life is seen. This ancient Celtic blade, uh, weathered by time and circumstance, points upwards, intersecting the sacred geometry of Metatron's cube. It's filled, its field of high vibrational frequencies ripple out through the creation. The sword, which represents intelligence, appears to sever the umbilical cord that joins the golden fetuses floating in the distance streaked in the dancing filaments of light. Male and female ancestral lines of limited being in the world are being severed. The Ace of Swords calls upon you to cut away anything that doesn't move you toward your highest potential and service in the world. It invites the birth and collaboration of all your intelligences so you can live into the full force field of your life. Advanced brain mapping technologies can visually illustrate 
the different types of intelligence over turning the long-held notion of innate preferences for left versus right brain intelligence. For instance, the theory of multiple intelligences aims to broaden the definitions so it reflects the many ways people think, learn, and act. This is a different way of thought than unified general intelligence or IQ. Take a contemporary dancer, for example. Their agility, skill, strength, and precision could be said to have a combination of bodily kinesthetic and visual spatial intelligences. Someone like Bowie, this is David Bowie, then would have a predominant music, musical rhythmic and harmonic intelligence with an acute sensitivity to musical components and pitch. Combine this with the aforementioned intelligences and you get an artist with a high verbal linguistic intelligence and existential intelligence. You can hear it through his striking lyrics, which lit up the creative heart of so many people throughout his long career. This card indicates an opportunity for powerful forces. Hone all your intelligences in the spirit of great teamwork to work toward a vision of yourself, realizing your highest potential, flow, and radiance. Consider, best, uh, consider fresh ways of understanding, organizing, articulating, and expressing your sense of purpose. You can achieve anything you desire. Reversed, holding onto the past, a refusal to move for forward, rigidity and unwillingness to change, experiment and explore, nothing new can arise. A lack of confidence in your intelligence and abil abilities cause tremendous inertia. Okay, that was the ACE. Any comments there on the ACE before we go on? It's interesting to me that the, <clears throat> the two larger figures are fetus, feta, fetus, mm -hmm. And then they're holding upside down a fetus that the umbilical cord at the top then holds out the smaller fetus on either side at the top. Yep. It's, it's as if there are three life forms and one of them is the two are breech and then the one in the middle has turned down to birth and then it is what it looks like to me. I see that it's like alien eyes and little heads uh, on the <laughs> bottom. It's got small, medium and large fetus on either side. Yeah, it's a, it's a powerful image, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah. And the yellow, it also uses yeah. opposite colors. Uh, purple is the opposite of yellow. So yeah. it, not only does it does it use parallel opposition, but it uses it also in the dynamics of the colors that it's using. Which right. we, whenever an opposite color is next to the other, it causes vibration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wonder how this is even achieved. It must be done with spray paint or something. Uh, it's, it seems to be a di digital, like a lot of Photoshop work yeah. or Illustrator. Yeah, it has um, something about that. Yeah. The sword yeah. looks really, to me, it looks like a wooden sword, sword mm -hmm. not yeah. even rusty. It, it yeah, especially like down in here it does, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's your, that's a good point. Instead of just being weathered and rusted and, and water damaged over time, yeah. the handle is crystal clear, relic antique, and the blade itself is basically had the heck beaten out of it over yeah. time. It's kind of like nature making this, the sever, you know, between yeah. the, the fetus, which mm -hmm. is weird, just... That's a good point. I, I think that, that that card is just weird. <laughs> yeah, it is and weird. That symbol in Maybe it circle. represents the the root of a, a family tree. Yeah, yeah. Or, yeah. Or, or a tree of life. I was thinking that that shape that's within the circle is almost representing a kind of tree of life. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, okay. yeah, it is because the flower of life is in the middle. It definitely um, is. It says Metatron's cube, but the thing is, with uh, with Metatron's cube, I mean, that's a six pointed figure that's essentially a cube within a star of David or a six pointed star. But they have the bottom sphere. If you look at the Tree of Life here, you've got Metatron's cube here. 
He's six points, but at the bottom, you've got exactly the figure that you see there with this additional sphere at the bottom. So yeah. that's definitely the tree of life and not Metatron's cube. Yeah, it has. Yeah. Still, I rather like, I like these descriptions of these two writers very much personally. Yeah. Okay, now here's the Queen of Swords. And she also seems to have a wand. Um, let me back up so you can see the whole thing. She's got a uh, she's a, got an owl behind her, so that would indicate wisdom, I guess. Is that large enough for everybody? So that you can see the whole image. Yeah, I guess I can do it that way. All right. Now it's it's better now. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let Thank me you. read. Let me read this right up quickly. Um, the Queen of Swords, I serve a noble cause. In mythology, the Queen of Swords was often rather simplistically conceived as an ice queen. This highly intelligent, forthright, and principled woman is tied to performing her duties and obligations as a monarch. She is not afraid for heads to roll when she needs to protect her own or her kingdom's interests, but the dark tears symbolize the sadness she bears at its, as a consequence. Uh, for her is no lover of execution and death. In, in lie, to live in integrity, she would far rather build alliances than her, with her adversaries than use brute force. And I just think of Queen Elizabeth and Mm -hmm. as played in the, in the movie of Elizabeth. Uh, she is dressed here in a Starman samurai kimono. It represents her self-discipline, courage, independence, honor, and willingness to serve her kingdom no matter what. As head of state, she offers excellent counsel and constructive criticism uh, with a piercing intelligence and well-earned wisdom. Here, she handles sacred medicinal plants, which have co-evolved with human beings for millennia. Uh, we use them to, for healing and guidance as part of spiritual practice. We eat plants, drink their juices, ferment and distill libations from them. We consume them in a thousand forms, while some are toxic, like the berries of nightshade, holly, and dogwood. Many have proved extraordinarily valuable. Evidence of the use of herbal remedies, for example, goes back 60,000 years to a burial, burial site in Iraq. Today, the majority of the world's population, an estimated 5 billion people, I'd say 7.5 billion, uh, use uh, folk me medicine for both acute and chronic health conditions. The Queen's medicinal journey enables her to cleanse herself of toxic thoughts and experiences, a form of spiritual cleansing to restore the uh, mind-body connection had with heart. Self-sufficient and perhaps a perfectionist, she is phenomenally capable, knowledgeable, and engaging with a brilliant intellect able to penetrate into the source of a problem, whether the domain is personal, political, or corporate. Her keen intelligence quickly strips away what's not important, accurately reflecting the facts and uncovering priorities and values. In the process, she uses her own experience to help illustrate and unmask self-defeating patterns understanding deeply on all levels the importance of a stitch in time to save nine. She applies this rigorous effectiveness with her own children regarding it as her maternal duty to see her children grow up to be well-rounded, cultured and highly educated, ethical adults. Not only in the warmest of mothers due to the heavy burdens of duty she does bring compassion and a deep understanding of the vicissitudes and trials of life. The Queen of Swords is deeply committed to them, 
contributing to their gifts and talents effectively and making a difference in the world. Reversed, the Queen of Swords becomes embittered, her searing intelligence instead of being released exquisitely into the world to serve a noble idea is turned inwards in terrible self-reproach or outwards to blame. Uh, her emotional and intellectual intelligences are seriously out of balance, either as a dried out husk, her intellect lashes out to attack, to attack or destroy devoid of the juiciness and fecundity of love and positive emotion or flooded by emotions, she sinks into the mire of depression, paranoia, unable to see and think things through logically. Nurturing can take care of both of these tendencies. Okay, so comments on that one. Medusa. Yeah, Medusa, that that thing, I, I thought it too, with the hands and, and the hair. Uh -huh. But the, the, the part that strikes me the most is the book with a hole in it, which to me symbolizes that um, you can never read anything in a passive way. Like you, you have to put holes in every book that you read, in every, in every knowledge that you get, not in order to destroy it, but to, to, I don't know, have a refined way of interacting with it, you know, just not. It. Yeah. yeah. I have a comment <laughs> along those lines I'd like to make. I, I wanted to say this a while back when Annabelle was making, making a point and it just, it, it flooded off, um, but you know, along the lines of wisdom and access to infinite knowledge and lack of application and all of that kind of thing, um, I I really I know I've sent an email to everybody in the group. I, I don't I don't know if I sent it to you or not, Gilda, but I've been reading a book by uh, an author Thomas More that is just absolutely phenomenal. It, it deals with the idea of soul, and I think that's kind of one of the number one things that he writes about. I think his best known book is called Care of the Soul. Yeah. But it, that's, it's really been a wonderful perspective for me because as I said earlier, you know, I'm such a strong thinking type that I don't tend to think about things uh, very soulfully. I wrote all of that stuff into my presentation, not to state my, uh, my own way of orienting to the world, but to kind of write my struggles into my presentation as well and say, you know, that that was equally advice to myself as much as it would be to anybody else. Yeah. But the thing that I really love about that is that um, in, in one of his talks that I was listening to, he was saying, you know, how he tries to approach um, all things as best he can, as soulfully as he can, and that oftentimes requ requires an open head. And, you know, he also said that um, James Hillman once told him that probably the best way that anyone could live very soulfully would be to really sit with your inferiority and don't run away from it, but really right. sit in it when it comes up. And, you know, that's absolutely brilliant advice. And, and you know, I, I'm going to try to use that as, as some kind of mantra when I possibly can. Right, right, Lisa, humility. Um, but, you know, he also goes on to say that <laughs> he's just attempting to make his point by saying that I often have inferiority when I'm in a group of intellectual people, as I often am, and I seem to be around those kinds of people that have just read every great book. You know, they're just like, they've read it all, and they always say to you, like, oh, of course I've read uh, the marriage of heaven and hell have you not and stuff like that yeah. i i really relate you know there are a lot of things that i have read and there are way more things that i never have read and never will mm -hmm. the thing is that brought up something really really poignant for me because the problem with with thinking and being a thinking type is that that's the way that we orient to the world and the problem with thinking is that it's just it's an and it's an endless process thinking leads to more thinking and mm -hmm. i think approaching a situation with soul means rather uh, than intellectualizing a situation just being present in a situation 
and not taking the infinite storehouse of useless factoids and whatever we think of as wisdom <laughs> and all of that stuff in any situation. And I, I don't know if that makes sense to anybody else, but that's just a point that, that was recurring for me. And I wanted to say that because since I mentioned soul so many times in my presentation, I felt like I needed to clarify what I meant by saying that we can over intellectualize situations to death or we can approach situations openly, presently, soulfully, and probably do just as well, if not better. Probably you know, better. I couldn't say, I couldn't agree anymore. And uh, Raquel's point too, I mean, the Medusa, but the book struck me almost immediately is, yeah. is cool. in three ways. One, the treasures of learning. Two, the treasure has been harvested from that book. So rather than putting a hole in knowledge, someone took the good stuff out. But then to me, what I found curiously punny is the book also to me refers to Pallas Athena, Minerva, because an old strategy used to be, well, criminals are dumb and illiterate. So hide them in the, hide the treasure in the books. So some people would take the books they either already read or that were just decor in their house and they would cut pockets in them and they would put their valuables in them and put them on the shelves because they knew that the, the things that were like the rubies and the old things that were relics, the criminals would come in and they would steal the, steal the silver, but they're illiterate. So they would never think to open a book. And that's where they would literally hide the treasure in the book. So to me, there was a one, two, three mundane. Um, and I laughed at the mundane piece, hide the treasure in the book would be a environmental strategy. You're aware of how to protect your assets. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, to me, it perfect. gave me a sense of that there's something hollow. There's a hollow in the book. Nice. And that hollow is, is they're hollow because they don't study or the others are hollow because they don't know. There's a hollow uh, involved in learning. Yeah. It's not all that it appears yeah. hollow. We're yeah. hollow inside. The and space between, to, yeah. And as to Nicholas, when he was talking about the intellect, um, there are five branches as uh, in mystical studies. So there's the physical, there's the emotional, there's the subtle, there's the intellectual, and there's the mind. The intelligence arranges and organizes. The mind just shows you stuff. The physical you supports you as a structure and the emotional is the flow and response of everything. And it's all about having all of these in, in an arrangement that supports you and evolves you. Mm -hmm. Any one of them going in that direction all will lead you to a wall yeah. yes. or destruction. Yeah, and then that yeah. five points, I mean, Nicholas alluded to that with the psychic proportionality. Yeah. Yeah, that was yeah. that was precisely my point because I know that, you know, it's I, I think everybody who approaches the idea of, of the anima and young and all of that stuff and the soul, whether it be the soul within man or in woman, um, because young was also a thinking type um, of a different variety, I believe, but mm -hmm. most definitely a thinking type as he self-identified himself. Um, I think there's a tendency to think of this idea of the soul as an intellectual concept. Like people don't approach it. People right. are like, Oh, maybe I can intellectualize and extrapolate the soul from Jung's theory and really approach it. But I think there's an incredible disparity between like the construct and the concept of the soul and actually like living with that as a reality. Um, it's I'm almost more important to be comfortable with the not know. Yeah, just wanted to mention that there's another one of the She-Wolf deck that I really liked, which was the Knight of Swords. And yeah. notice this, <laughs> this arch of the naked woman. And uh, let's see if I can get close enough here. Oh, that's the old Egyptian myth directly yeah. painted. And it's got all these stars mm. all over her. And there's not a single so so sword in the card, but, you know, it, at first, when we were first working, working with the She-Wolf deck, I thought, wow, this is a really feminine <laughs> deck because of, it's by definition She-Wolf. Um, but mm. um, 
but Devani uh, Wolf has, and her name is Wolf, right? Um, I think she's done a terrific job of, of pulling together uh, the ideas of the Tarot and the stack. I agree. On that Knight of Swords, can you look closely again? Is Does the character on the bottom have an egg tooth? like a serpent would to puncture the leather of the egg to emerge out of the overarching divine figure on top. That might match the Egyptian story um, yeah, where instead of a sword, that. it would be a small pointed tooth. Well, like, well there is, there, there are three pyramids, but um, I don't see any egg. Can't tooth. See it. I can't see with the, um, yeah. no, uh, you're, the, be, you're becoming transparent. Yeah. Well, they, they're just uh, opposite where my ring finger is here. Mm. And, and he's actually standing on like a, okay. like a ring of Saturn. Crazy. Yeah. I mean, there's no sword in this card. Except so. the, mm. the raised hand pointed. Is that? Yeah, I guess I, so. I, I would always like to share that we often, uh, perhaps, Jung comes in his individuation uh, I think most of it clicked because he used dream work, dream work, and dream work will give you all your all your defects, your triggers, your it's all there every yeah, day. Yeah. If you write your dreams and look at them and analyze them every day, there's nowhere to hide yeah. because our <laughs> interior does not lie. Yep. It's done in metaphor, yes, but eventually, if you do it long enough, it creates a loop. And yep. you create a loop that it, it uh, lunar and daylight awareness become one, and you and and you cannot have any more depth than that does not exist mm -hmm. because it goes to as as deep as you could ever go. Somehow we have to figure out how to get your uh, your bell. Is it a ballet or an opera about the terrain? Um, it can be anything. I mean, once is once is. Uh, I thought the best thing is to put it in a book nowadays at the time it was ripe for for the performance mm -hmm. but you know uh when something's speaking and it doesn't meet meet is counterpoint in order to be produced then that's the end of that um but um it is like a structure of a symphony let's say i mean for lack of a better word it yeah. it had that means that it can be done over and over and over again under like tarot it's, mm -hmm. it, it, it can be interpreted and done in, in whichever way. Ways, I yeah. gave it the interpretation that I gave it and as an introduction to show that it is alive. It is alive. It is, yeah. it is not something that the tarot is not some, just a bunch of symbols. And it, has, it is an initiation of life. Hilda, it is Hilda I will say this, and I, I will take the liberty to speak for the entire group. Uh, if you need some people to be in your ballet or your play, <laughs> we're your people. All right. We're there. Oh. <laughs> oh my God. Well, I'll, I'll, go, it goes I'll like be, this. I'll be happy to, to be a director. Oh, you, you would say, love it. I just, it goes, goes like this. Chair for Skip. He's going to huh? take the, he's going to wave his finger. No, oh, no. You'll there. love it. You'll understand it perfectly. And, and the motto of it, the motto is who has the right to heaven, spiritual wings, Metal wings or spiritual wings, so that that's what nice. goes on. Well, Lisa had her hand up earlier, and I know she Go just ahead, had a Lisa. comment. There were words on the Starman um, Tarot Queen of Swords card. Um, Lisa, did you have a comment at this point? I, I just couldn't read what the the words were couldn't on that on the, on the Queen. I, I couldn't either. Yeah. I could see them, but I I didn't catch them all. You said like to do Starman and then disappear. Or? Yeah, on, on the Queen the of Starman Wands, about a Queen. third, third of the way up from the bottom on the left. I think there were some words. Well, you know, it kind really of went perfect. across from the left to the right of the card. Okay, let me see if I can. Uh, I think I think they're just a schematic writing. Uh, I've noticed in several of those cards that there's always writing, and it's always as if we're looking through a glass structure into these people inside of the glass structure writing on the glass. Right. It's just sometimes uh, it's backwards. Right. 
And it's it's, or else, it's always a piece of this that card. Way. Could it the, could it have been the words that came out of the the book? Out of the whole. Oh book? yeah. Oh wow. Could be. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they hatched into the card. Um, oh yeah, the the pieces of the book it looks like might be around her neck right there. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very interesting uh, thank observation you for that they, it is yeah. because i'm like why are there toilet paper rolls and i'm like okay leave that alone that's not what they are I, that's yeah, you're wrong yeah. and, but you're right there's scrolls uh, yeah. mm -hmm. and yeah. and uh the the various eyes here are very interesting yeah lots of mandalas yeah. there yeah. Yeah. Lots, lots of eyes yeah the yeah. eyes are actually in the shape of the the mandalas i think yeah they're the mandalas. tree of lives yeah Mm -hmm. And then yeah, there's a floor pattern, way. the three dimension that uh, um, flower of life pattern is then shown in perspective in her chest, right between the clavicles. It's like a 3D architectural image colored in that it made it into a tile floor mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. There's know. a tree of life in her belly, a tree of life uh, mm -hmm. in the back of the card. Yeah. Sacred geometry. Yeah. Right. Are her fingers like snakes? Or, yeah, yeah, like Medusa. Because you she, see the snakes the Medusa in her came hair. Out of, no more in the head. The Medusa now is in her fingers. <laughs> the, the snakes are in her fingers. And right. Medusa and was, was actually... her earrings. <laughs> yeah, Medusa, oh, yeah, I, I, what I remember from mythology, she mm -hmm. was punished by Athena, I think. Because, because she was more beautiful. Beard. She was, yeah. yeah, she was, yeah, Athena was jealous that yeah. Medusa was more beautiful. I mean, the whole, and then that, that theme actually then is co-opted and plays into um, the, uh, you know, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all. I mean, you get that yeah. same jealousy of the queen versus, um, I can't remember her name. Um, Snow White? No. Snow White. Yeah. Cause yeah. yeah Snow White's more beautiful than Snow White um, has to eat the poison apple. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then I mean, her heart is, is in some way her heart is transformed because I you can look at the entire thing and nothing the visceralness of the heart, which is so potent and red and so on, is mm -hmm. not necessarily here, it's all over the place, kind of thing. So it's, the words that are at an angle, yeah, they go all the way across. That's from the left to yeah, the right. Like, want... It's like I get a sense that whoever did this is not a female, but no, I could be oh, wrong. No. That's right. right. It's, a, it's a man, correct? Yes. Yes, yeah. I, I can. I, the sense is very obvious to me. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. He, he wanted the blood, and <laughs> yeah, it's that. Well, it's got a very masculine sci-fi quality to it, mm -hmm. rather than yeah, yeah. yes. And, Mm -hmm. Well, that I mean, that's what the whole deck is, but uh, right, especially this card. That but I, I, I love his write ups, though. He he really gets the essence of these things, I think, and yeah, in, in a different way than Devani Wolf does. And that's that's why I like to talk about them side by side. But they're anyway, both so dense and you know, in such a different way. So, I mean, I, I really appreciate the intensity of both of their perspectives, yeah. Okay. Um, but I also been... enjoy when a tarot card deck has, you cannot tell that it is a female who did it or a male. Yeah. Because all the perspectives well, there is that, are there. Yeah. Uh, and and so, the writer deck has that. Yeah. Um, oh my, it's 11 o'clock. <laughs> it's 11 yeah. o'clock. <laughs> um, Amazing. Been here four hours. Okay, so, three on... So anyway, uh, yes, we're under four hours here, which is about my limit, especially. And so um, Lisa had a contribution tarot. to cups, and maybe we will read that in next week. Is that is that acceptable, Lisa, or shall we do it? We can do it. Oh, whatever, whatever you want to do, whatever you feel comfortable doing is. And Lisa, come on. It's only a couple of pages. You want me to just go yeah, ahead and read why, it? Why don't, why don't you go ahead and read it? Can uh, Lisa? Put on her video. No. To no, she eyes. doesn't. She, Thank that, you. That's not something that's okay. she's comfortable with. Okay. Right, and she, she doesn't has, honor. She and, has and Jordan to read it. So, 
um, but this is about cups. It's not about swords. So. Right. She had a, a wonderfully profound um, thought on cups. So let me read uh, what Lisa wrote after last week in regards to the cups and the tarot. And then that'll Se- be a wrap. <laughs> yeah, it'd be a wrap. Um, yeah, okay. So sexual innuendo is profound and prolific throughout the suit of cups, perhaps because cups are akin to the suit of hearts, the element of water which deals with human emotion. When humans have emotion, the energies need to be artfully expressed in some form, a form that holds value, be it written, acting, sexual, and providing service. I see the white hand as representing the hand of God in each of the aces. Firm grip equals masculine. Feminine is the graceful hand. With respect to facing right, being conscious and objective, and facing left as being unconscious and subjective. The Ace of Cups, my interpretation of this card, representation of the hand of God as creator, sliding in through waves of emotion, the waves of passion depicted by Ioni. Notice the labia at God's wrist. The graceful hand of God holds on to the chalice. Chalice represents the universal fountain of youth, the moisture, droplets, from the flowing fountain are like dreams of the youth, dreams of becoming something important, maybe a star. The waves can also represent clouds, a cloud of dreams, as within and so without, the chalice representing the universe and uterus. Isn't the similarity between these words curious, universe, and uterus? As above, so below, the cross of matter, where heaven meets the material plane on the water, the host presented by the white dove. Notice its shape, its color, is, its color is youthful, virginal white, love and passion abounds, represented by red flowers on hearts floating on the calm seas. Conversely, the Queen of Cups card, the chalice has been crowned, its shape similar to, though no longer the virginal white youthful winged dove, Rather, it has the claws of a vulture with the queen looking towards the past. Queen is holding on to secrets hidden beneath her throne, thrown in quotes, as well as her bony grip of her right hand onto the chalice. There is no longer the flow of moisture from the fountain of youth, but the passage of time has muddied the murky emotions and brought sludge or raw sewage overflowing from her throne to her feet mixed in with the material wealth of her dreams. The queen evolves into the crone who is sadly bound to the past and was once and past and was once was. Sadly bound to the past and was once was. Or we can consider her as the death mother while the king looks ahead towards the future with a firm grip of his staff representing the phallus. The Two of Cups, a new new couple signifying a union, unity in the duality. The Roman numeral two is the glyph for Gemini with Hermes or Mercury Mercury as Lord. Keep in mind the wings on the helmet and winged feet of Mercury. The caduceus is also a symbol of of signification. As such, to me, this card suggests a Geminian or Geminian component roaring of passion as depicted by the red-winged lion. Perhaps it is the newlyweds who scream passion, though hiding behind society's rules of appropriate behavior. Note her red shoes, hot feet as opposed to cold feet, the new bride wearing virginal white gown under her smock. Notice the lines at the back of the smock, horizontal at the shoulders. Shoulders are under the dominion of Gemini, becoming crosses at the buttocks. Buttocks is under the dominion of Scorpio and is and also a consideration of sexual appetite. So there is a scorpionic component as well, duality. The position of the woman does suggest she is looking forward to the union. The groom's headpiece could represent that his passion is in his head. Where's my place here? And... Okay. Is this with reference to the writer deck? There, with reference to the writer deck that we looked at last week with Cubs. Yeah. 
So, yeah, the groom's headpiece could represent that his passion is in his head. Caduceus, chakras, kundalini. Notice the placement of their chalices or cups in relation to the caduceus in between the base or root chakra and the second chakra dealing with sexuality, representing the importance in establishing a strong foundation for this union. Passion is key and an integral part of the life cycle. Note the serpents on the ground. Three of cups. I'm sensing that this card depicts a life of joy and abundance. Maiden, matron, crone, a woman of wisdom, very Jupiterian, Sagittarian, the ripest fruit at the maiden's feet. Notice the serpents by the matron's feet, suggesting years of se sexual, sexual reproduction, bearing fruit, and overripened over fruit behind the crone. Four of Cups, representing the IC. I think, yeah, the IC of the astrological wheel. With gaining an understanding of the flow of storytelling and tarot, I now see this card from a different perspective. The sad man seated at the base of the family tree is a groom from the Two of Cups card and is, and is a state of reflection as he is being offered a choice a family represented by the three chalices or begin anew as offered by the single chalice. Five of cups, the groom has made his choice. He wears the same yellow boots, but now his thoughts are pure white hair, are pure as indicated by the white hair. He now is filled with, re with regrets or embarrassment, red face with what he has decided. The passion is spilled from the cups there is no longer passion in the home, only a bridge, which can represent greener pastures. Six of cups, my cups runneth over, depicting an abundant and healthy life. There is no longer a need for passion in the home or castle. It could be that the older woman is the bride from the two of cups card because she's wearing the same shoes. Her flowers no longer hold the passion as they once did. Notice the cross of matter is now on a shield representing a defined boundary. And she had stopped there at the Six of Cups. And thank you, Lisa, for that powerful perspective um, on, on the Cups cards from last week. Yeah, that's You're very welcome. interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, hope I, I hope I didn't butcher in the reading too much. Yeah, I'm, so. oh, no, I'm no. sorry I didn't get started putting them up soon enough. But anyway. Well, I was, oh, yeah, thanks um, for sharing that. But, you're welcome. But most of us have uh, Rider Waite decks, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Most anybody that is looking at the throw is yeah. looking at Rider Waite. Um, it's a good deck, too, because I find, too, in readings that some people, um, they just have it as kind of an indelible reference point where it's they'll get a new idea easier if they see that image and then a different image. But... Um, it's just so basically clear also. Yeah. Okay, uh, well, thank you everyone, not only everyone here, but everyone on uh, YouTube who has visited. There have been quite a lot of people uh, on there. And on, thank you, Nick. On Good. YouTube. And thank you, Nick, for doing Solid wonderful. presentation. Yeah, of course. Actually, it's cutting. Nice. It's a Thank cutting you. presentation. Thank you. Of course, of course. My pleasure. And, and so next week, we have Raquel doing the coins. Wonderful. Yeah. Are, are you going <laughs> nice. to bring gold with you, Raquel? <laughs> I'm going to try. <laughs> Actually, Nick, your presentation was sharp. <laughs> yes, that's the right pun. It I'll put that sharp. back in the scabbard now and get rid of the pun. So, so got everybody. Yeah, so Raquel for Raquel is one fifteen in the morning. So we're gonna yeah release oh, everybody oh, wow. here. So thank thank you for being here, Raquel. Take care. Thank you, Nick, right. for for today's lesson. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.